Welcome everyone. Today we are continuing our series of the iTrue webinar. We have an exciting program lined up. We have done the similar BPH topic last year, but when you compare to last year, we have traveled a lot. One-stop clinics, impact of gripped protocol, how we can set up a clinic with the help of the clinical nurse specialist, they are now taken the center stage. Of course, we will discuss other important things like fellowship in male LUTS, how to set up the LUTS and benign prostate services in a developing country. And we discuss two important aspects. One is HOLEP, other one is the evolving robotic assisted prostatectomy. Many thanks for the wonderful array of the faculty who took enough time to give all the evidence behind the recent treatment modalities in the BPH. To start the show, we have Dr. Tanuj Paul Bhatia. He is uh, quite an expert and well known in India. He is going to discuss with us the evaluation of male LUTS. He is an expert in HOLAP. He did spoke about HOLAP in the last ITRU BPH webinar. This time he is going to take us to the basics. Good evening, dear friends. At the outset, I would like to thank ITRU Group and Dr. Ananda for this opportunity. I will be talking about evaluation of male LUTs. I am Dr. Tanishpal Bhatia from Faridabad, India. So we know that LUTs is a term that covers symptoms that result from conditions and diseases affecting the bladder and the urethra. These can be storage symptoms like urgency, urgent continence, frequency, and nocturia or voiding symptoms like interrupted stream, terminal dribble, hesitancy, and straining. And they can also be post micturation symptoms like dribbling or incontinence and sensation of incomplete voiding. The recently uh, released Indian guidelines, they define LUTs as a variety of symptoms of storage failure, voiding failure, and post micturation symptoms that result from variety of complex and dynamic interactions between the bladder, prostate, and urethra, as well as the result of several systemic diseases and neurological conditions. We know that there can be several uh, causes leading to lower urinary tract symptoms. This can be the most common benign prostatic obstruction or overactive bladder or nocturnal polyuria, underactive bladder, pelvic pain syndrome, neurological causes, foreign bodies, uh, urethral strictures, uh, ureteric stones, etc. So we know that LUTs affects the quality of life. More severe the LUTs, more worse is the quality of life. And it has also been seen that when intervention is done in form of medical therapy or surgery, as the uh, LUTs decrease, uh, the quality of life improves. Coming to evaluation of male LUTs. So we know we always start with the medical history. There should be a focused medical history. Uh, assessing the symptoms of the patient. We should ask the patient the medications he has been on. We should also assess for other medical and neurological diseases, and we should assess the social and psychological factors. This has a strong recommendation from the EU guidelines that we should take a complete medical history for men with LUTs. Now coming to symptom score questionnaires. All guidelines recommend using validated questionnaires. Symptom scores are helpful in quantifying LUTs and in identifying which type of symptoms are predominant. However, they are not disease specific or gender specific or age specific. IPSS is the most commonly used symptom score for LUTs. Uh, AUA SI was adapted by WHO and uh, element of quality of life was added and labeled as IPSS score. The limitations of IPSS are that it lacks an assessment of incontinence, uh, post maturation symptoms and the bother caused by each separate symptom. Also, IPSS score has to be translated to different language and validated. This is another questionnaire which is used, ICIQ MLUTS. Uh, it contains 13 items. Uh, it's a more detailed uh, questionnaire covering hesitancy, straining, uh, strength of stream, intermittency, incomplete, emptying, urgency, urge incontinence, stress incontinence, unexplained incontinence, nocturnal aneurysis, post micturition dribble, nocturia, and frequency. Its validity, reliability, and responsiveness has been established. 
However, in India, this symptom scale is not commonly used. Coming to visual prostate symptom score. Many men require assistance to fill up the IPSS forms, especially in the subcontinent where uh, the literacy level varies between different patients and many are actually illiterate. And IPSS also has to be translated to many languages requiring separate validation. So Wonderwalt et al. developed a visual prostate symptom score in form of pictograms, uh, which can be filled by uh, patients with different level of literacy. And Roy et al. validated the VPSS in Indian rural population and found it to correlate with IPSS. This is the VPSS score on left side and on right side is the uh, improvised VPSS score by uh, Dr. Venugopal Saran group, uh, wherein they have uh, uh, defined severity uh, based on the score achieved uh, between mild, moderate and severe. So uh, all the guidelines, as I said, uh, recommend using a, a symptom score. Uh, they, they recommend that you should use a validated symptom score questionnaire, including the bother and quality of life. Or during assessment of loads and also for re-evaluation during or after the treatment. Regarding frequency volume charts and bladder diaries, uh, there is a strong recommendation from EU guidelines to use uh, bladder diary in uh, patients with uh, male loads with predominantly storage uh, component of symptoms or nocturia. And uh, patients should be asked to complete the bladder diary for at least three days. Coming to physical examination, it is uh, very important that we should physically examine the patient. One should examine the suprapubic area, the perineum, the external genitalia, the digital rectal examination and the lower limbs. One should also look for any urethral discharge, phimosis, meatosinosis or penile lesions. Digital rectal examination, one should look for the prostate size, consistency, tenderness and anal tone. There are different ways in which uh, it has been described that the size can be assessed. One such way is shown in this diagram where the fingertip is compared to about 10 gram of tissue and uh, multiples of that can be assessed for uh, assessing the prostate size. However, it has been seen that it does not uh, really correlate well with the uh, truss volume or the rejected uh, prostate volume. Uh, so there is a strong recommendation from the guidelines to perform a physical examination and DRE in patients uh, with LUTs. Now, a resident should know what is an abnormal digital rectal examination. So we call it an abnormal DRE when there is a nodule. Uh, it can be a hard or a hard or a firm nodule. Then the prostate is hard in consistency. When there is irregularity of the surface of prostate, if there is any fixity of the rectal mucosa, and if there is asymmetrical enlargement, one lobe is enlarged more than the other lobe. Now coming to the investigations that we do, uh, urine analysis is a, a cheap and easily available investigation. It helps us to identify issues like UTI, diabetes and hematuria. And there's a strong recommendation that urine analysis should be used in assessment of male alerts. Coming to prostate specific antigen, PSA has a good uh, predictive value for assessing prostate volume. Uh, the potential benefits enhanced should be discussed with the patient only then uh, we should order a PSA test. Most guidelines recommend a PSA test if PSA is going to change the management plan and if the life expectancy of the patient is more than 10 years. So same is the recommendation for from both in, uh, Indian and uh, European guidelines that it is a optional test in evaluation of male lids and it should be done if it is going to change the management plan and if the life expectancy is more than 10 years. Now coming to renal functional assessment, Renal function may be assessed by assessing the serum creatinine or EGFR, uh, hydronephrosis, renal insufficiency or retention are more prevalent in patients uh, with BPH. Even though VPO uh, may be responsible for these complications, there is no conclusive evidence on the mechanism how it uh, affects the renal function. Uh, if a patient has a poor flow and he has history of hypertension and diabetes, then there are more chances he will be having associated CKD and the patients with CKD are increased risk of developing post-operative complications. So the uh, guideline recommendation is that uh, the renal function should be assessed if renal impairment is suspected based on history and clinical examination or in presence of hydronephrosis when considering surgical treatment for uh, male LUTs. Now coming to uroflometry, it is widely used and a non-invasive test, uh, poor flow, uh, can arise as a consequence of bladder outlet obstruction, detrus or underactivity or an underfilled bladder as well. Uh, therefore, it is limited use uh, as a diagnostic test 
as it is, it is unable to discriminate between the underlying mechanism. It can be used for monitoring treatment outcomes and correlating symptoms with objective findings. So there's a weak recommendation to perform uroflammetry in initial assessment of LUTs, but there is a strong recommendation to perform uroflammetry prior to any medical or surgical invasive treatment. Now coming to ultrasound, uh, this can be in form of trans abdominal ultrasound, trans rectal ultrasound, or a post void rescue uh, assessment. Ultrasonography is widely available in India, although bladder scanners and catheters are not routinely used for PVR assessment. Uh, upper tract evaluation is warranted when there is a large PVR, correlation of raised PVR and UTI, and severity of uh, LUTs is not clear with ultrasound. Uh, there is little correlation between PVR and bladder outlet obstruction. Uh, it is commonly stated that trust is more accurate than transabdominal ultrasound in predicting the volume of adenoma uh, inucleated during open surgery. Trust has a better role than DRE in estimating the prostate weight. Uh, it is also now becoming more and more important to assess the intravesical prostate intrusion. It can be graded as mild, moderate, or severe uh, based on the level of intrusion of prostate into the bladder. The Korean and Singapore guidelines recommend measurement of IPP on ultrasound, it has been seen to correlate with the degree of prosthetic obstruction, the likelihood of failure of a trial without catheter, and also with progression of PPH. Uh, these are the recommendations from guidelines. If I talk about Indian guidelines, they give a conditional recommendation to measure PVR in men with LUTs. They give a conditional recommendation to perform ultrasound for upper tract in men with LUTs. Uh, but because it is widely available, it is commonly used in India. Uh, the, uh, Prostate ultrasound for prostate size uh, is optional if it will change the medical uh, management. And there's a strong recommendation to perform prostate ultrasound before deciding on the surgical management of BPH. Then there are other imaging modalities like CT and MRI, which are rarely used in initial evaluation of LUTs. Avoiding cystorethrogram is to be performed if you are suspecting that patient can have reflux or diverticulum or a urethral structure. Cystoscopy. Uh, should be done in patients with microscopic or gross hematuria uh, suspected, I mean, history of microscopic or gross hematuria, history of urethral structure or bladder cancer who present with uh, LUTs, they should undergo cystoscopy during the diagnostic evaluation. Uh, none of the studies have uh, found a strong association between cystoscopy finding and urodynamic finding. Uh, while uh, urodynamic studies are a better way to diagnose bladder outlet obstruction, it is not widely available in India and cystoscopy is used by many to assess the bladder outlet obstruction. Uh, from EAU, there is a weak recommendation uh, to do cystoscopy in initial assessment. In the Indian guidelines, uh, there is a conditional uh, recommendation uh, to perform cystoscopy if it may change the plan of action to perform cystoscopy uh, before any planned surgical therapy and to perform cystoscopy for diagnosis of bladder outlet obstruction when UDS is not available uh, in, the, uh, in the facility or in the neighboring centers. And there's a strong recommendation when to perform cystoscopy in men with LUTs if they have hematuria, suspected stricture, or suspected bladder cancer. Uh, urodynamic study in male LUTs, the most wide, uh, widespread Invasive urodynamic studies employed are the filling systematry and pressure flow uh, studies. It does help us to differentiate between uh, detrusor underactivity under and bladder outlet obstruction. Uh, it also identifies detrusor overactivity, which is important in patients with predominantly storage symptoms. Due to invasive nature of the test, uh, UDS is generally only offered if the con conservative treatment has failed. Uh, routine use of UDS in evaluation of uncomplicated bloods has limited role and should be used only selectively. And also, there should be a rigorous quality control uh, when at the centers where UDS is being performed. So these are the recommendations. So uh, this flowchart basically summarizes the evaluation of uh, male LUTs. Uh, we have to start with a good history, uh, which should include assessment of sexual function, use of uh, symptom score questionnaires, urine analysis, and a physical examination. PSA uh, should be discussed with patient and then ordered or if there is a suspicion of CA prostate and a measurement of PVR should be done. Uh, if the PVR is significant, one can assess, get an ultrasound of the kidneys and uh, get a renal functional assessment as, as well. And uh, then you can decide whether you need a uroflometry or a urodynamic study, or you can start with the uh, uh, non-medical or uh, medical treatment for uh, patients.
Thank you. I would like to again thank you, ITO Group, for this opportunity. Thank you, Tanuj. That's a very useful presentation. And uh, this forms the basis of our whole program. And uh, I'm quite intrigued by the various uh, scoring sheets like uh, visual, prostate assessment, etc., which will really help the residents to score some brownie points like those who want to get some gold medal, etc. You have made a very nice attempt in marrying the Indian guidelines and the European urology guidelines. That's a very nice one. And you ended up with a nice flow chart, which is like a take home message and that will help in getting the overall summary done. Very good. That's a very nice start. Next in the list, we have uh, my dear colleague, Mr. Fahad Khan. He has done a lot of hard work in the past uh, few months in setting up the one-stop male LUTS clinic. For some of you in the different parts of the world, one-stop clinic itself is like a, like a gibberish word. Why one-stop? Why can't patient can attend multiple sittings? But there is no doubt that one-stop clinics, like for example, for elevated PSA, for testicular cancers, for male LUTS makes a big difference in the patient's pathway. Without much delay, I will invite uh, Mr. Khan to give his expert opinion. Great, thank you, Anand. Um, can you see my presentation? Yes, Fahad, please go ahead. That's great. Good afternoon, good evening, everybody uh, in India. It, um, thank you for having me on board uh, presenting at your Urology Global Residence Training Program. It's an honor to present here today. Uh, so I'll be presenting on setting up a one-stop uh, lower unit tract symptoms clinic. Um, so first and foremost, what I'd like you to do is bring your attention to this landmark publication um, that defined high quality care. So I'd like you to keep this just at the back of your minds. Uh, throughout this study, but essentially high, they defined as high quality care must be effective, efficient, safe, patient-centered, timely, and equitable. The outline of my talk, I'm gonna go through um, current UK outpatient practice. I'm gonna go through the perceived advantages of a one-stop LUTS clinic, why we need a dedicated one-stop male LUTS clinic, uh, followed by uh, the clinic model that we use in Birmingham uh, and a potential treatment pathway. In terms of current UK outpatient practice, um, patients are referred from primary care from the GP to us. Uh, for a new appointment, they can typically wait 20 weeks for an appointment and subsequently for follow-up, they can be waiting 32 weeks. Um, current outpatient practice is under extreme pe pressure at present, and that's the elephant in the room, COVID. Uh, new appointments, patients are currently waiting on our trust between 47 and 60 weeks, and for follow-up, uh, they're waiting up to 80 weeks. Um, so the current system is under extreme pressure. Uh, it suits no one. Patients are waiting weeks and weeks uh, to be seen. Um, subsequently, outpatient clinics are characterized by delays. There's often fragmented diagnostic processes, uh, particularly for LUTs. Uh, patients often have three to four outpatient visits until um, uh, the definitive surgery. This is subsequently bad for patients. This is potentially clinically dangerous. Uh, if you're not seeing patients for a long time to update them on the results of their scans, etc. It's bad for managers who subsequently spend hours trying to manage the failure. It's bad for doctors and nurses who try to respond by overloading their clinics and subsequently getting more stressed as, as a result. And it's bad for purchasers who have to fund these multiple outpatient visits. So what's the problem to this? Is it working harder? Um, well, simply working harder does not resolve the situation because often lack of commitment is not the problem. Um, is there all for us to do more clinics and more waiting list initiatives to try and clear the numbers? Um, often uh, this is, in fact, this can be argued that this makes the system worse because this creates follow-up bubbles uh, three to four months down the line with lots of patients who are subsequently waiting follow-ups uh, and then again has to be dealt with by the same team that are not coping with in the first place. Do you recruit extra consultants or more clinical nurse specialists? Um, and again, this has made little impact uh, as essentially you're recruiting them into the same process that are uh, so inefficient to start with. 
In terms of advantages for a one-stop clinic, um, a lot of publications have shown that redesigning your services uh, will deliver better care uh, to your patients. Uh, it needs to be redesigned uh, and deliver tailor-made, highly efficient and diagnostic outpatient services. Uh, and this has potential to, tr to transform the diagnostic efficiency, reduce the need for expensive follow-up. It virtually eliminates the um, time between referral and decision on definitive management and subsequently allows for patients with serious disease to be treated more quickly and those with little or miss can be reassured and subsequently discharged. Why do we need a one-stop male LUPS clinic? In UK, LUPS is a substantial reason for referral to our clinic. Approximately 25,000 bladder outflow procedures are performed in the UK per year and HES data currently shows that there's a deficit, deficit of 17 to 20,000 procedures uh, in 2021 alone. And as I said, our services are very overstretched. There's limited available resources. The patients are currently waiting a um, very long time to be seen. The definitive manager plans are often not reached until three to four hospital episodes. And often we find that patients are seen by a number of different urologists, different trainees, all of whom communicate a partial diagnosis that can lead uh, the patient and GP to get confused, frustrated, can lead to complaints as well. Uh, and last but not least, but it's uh, it's about uh, and girthed recommendation as well uh, to try and get uh, male nuts as a as a, as a one stop service. So this is our uh, um, one stop male LUTs clinic model that we um, uh, have here in Birmingham for our patients. So starting at the top, uh, patients are uh, initially referred by the GP after appropriate initial care um, in primary care, and that includes taking a comprehensive if history and examination, offering lifestyle advice, uh, completing a frequency volume chart and starting them on appropriate medication. Uh, they then come to us and the referral is triaged. Once the referral is triaged, they are sent information, including uh, a letter confirming their appointment, details of the one-stop clinic. Um, I'll show you that uh, sheet in a second. They're sent a bladder diary, uh, an IPSS questionnaire and an IIEF questionnaire. The patient is then uh, the list is vetted by the, on the day of the clinic, is vetted by the either the clinical nurse specialist or the urologist before the clinic, uh, and they have potential to have a number of tests performed on the day of the clinic. And these can include a urine dipstick, plus minus MSU, a flow rate, blood tests if needed, for example, a renal function or PSA if it's not already done so. We can also do a truss volume, uh, and if we have um, an AMBU disposable flexible cystoscopes, um, so you may want to do them if you're considering Eurolift or if a patient has a history uh, of hematuria or history of bladder cancer, for example, so flexible cystoscopy is on hand. Fundamentally, they will then have a consultation with a urologist and the outcome is fourfold. Either one, they'll be discharged with either advice and medical management. Two, they'll be added to the waiting list. Um, now, there are a couple of investigations here that they may go on to require. And at present, we don't have a role for these in the one stop. Um, but um, if they do require urodynamics uh, or an ultrasound scan or MOI, or for example, a CT angiogram for prostate artery embolization workup, then they'll go on to have these on another day. There's also a role for um, three appointments at the end of the clinic uh, for telephone clinic. And that's really for us to um, consult with those patients that may have had uh, previous investigations or those that are undecided on uh, a surgical treatment option and they're there to give us their decision. This is a copy of the information leaflet that we send out to our patients. Um, I think this is paramount of importance, actually. Um, I think it's, it's important that the patients know the details of the clinic, that they know uh, who they'll be seen by, what potential tests will happen on the day, um, and uh, so they can complete the questionnaires. Um, so it's quite a comprehensive um, patient information leaflet, so they know that they need to be there for about two to three hours, uh, and what potential tests may happen. This is our uh, treatment pathway that we follow for our patients here. Um, so starting from the top again, so patients have a symptom assessment, uh, DRE, um, post order residual volume plus minus bladder diary. They'll um, have a prostate volume and occasionally at urodynamics if there's di un di diagnostic uncertainty. Intensely, patients will be largely in two gr groups, whether they're lots of refractory to medical therapy or that, those that have declined medical therapy or those who are catheter dependent urinary retention. And essentially what we try to do is put those patients into three different groups based on their 
wishes and their symptoms, whether they wish to be considered for ejaculatory sparing uh, and be considered for minimum basis treatment options such as Eurolift and Resume, uh, or non-ejaculatory sparing and catheter dependent. And largely this depended on the size of the prostate. So by the end of the clinic, we'll ideally have um, the IPSS score, the prostate volume, residual volume, uh, we'll have a number of um, results available uh, to go through uh, each and one of these treatment options uh, for the patient. To conclude, um, a one-stop cl LUTS clinic allows the consultation and diagnostics to be performed on the same day. This can significantly reduce um, uh, patient pathways and waiting time. It can lead to high discharge rates, reduced follow-up rates, is increased patient and staff satisfaction as a result and ultimately most important patients have a decision made at the clinic appointment on what treatment they'll have thank you thank you Fahad. that's very comprehensive presentation and uh, i'm very sure this will help as a great tool for those who are interested in setting up in their own practice may I ask you have you come across any major challenges in setting up this clinic so that we can learn from your expertise yeah, in terms of um, um, major challenges, it's the um, it varies from unit to unit in terms of your hospital and what resources that you have available. Um, essentially, I think if you have your own urology unit uh, where you have a comprehensive department, um, that um, is the the, the 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 one of the most important thing. Secondly, uh, to get the help from the clinical nurse specialists. Um, so I think that's paramount importance. Um, and again, things like having access to flexible cystoscopy, um, an ultrasound scan machine in order to carry out the physical volume. The, these things that do need ironing out, but we, we've managed to sort those out fairly efficiently and fairly quickly. But I think this is, um, I think it will vary from unit to unit and what resources you have um, in terms of how quickly that you could set up this clinic. Well done, well done. I'm very sure this will help to feed the very nice techniques what we have in our department like Eurolift or whole yeah. Patients will get better counselling and better time to choose and better availability and early intervention also. I'm very sure yeah. maybe in 12 months time when we are doing the next BPH meeting, you can present some financial gain or whatever your learning Absolutely. tips and tricks. Yeah. Thank you very much. Why don't I have data on our, on our clinics? So that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Far. Next, we have a presentation from Sister Kelly. Unfortunately, uh, Sister Kelly is now held up in a clinic, so I'm going to present on her behalf. She is discussing the role of specialist nurse in male LUTS clinic. And this is something, again, will be a quite eye opener for people in the other countries because this is not something very commonly discussed also. And um, in my view, the clinical nurse specialist previously had a very heavy role in the oncology fund because of the Macmillan nurses and uh, the contributions. This is not just specific to urology. We have the clinical nurse specialist for colorectal, for pulmonary, dermatology, in most of the cancer specialties. But urology is so unique that we have the opportunity to have the clinical nurse specialist for the benign specialities also. Now, how they work out in our one-stop LUTS assessment clinic? First of all, as uh, Mr. Khan mentioned, we have significant number of referrals for BPH and uh, we don't have the capacity to recruit a lot of consultants. So there is a role for the clinical specialist nurses. And a lot of the steps what Mr. Khan mentioned has got the diagnostics like, for example, flexible stroscopy, trust volume for measurement of the prostate, flow rate, they can be completely and independently handled by the clinical nurse specialist. So the aim in Kelly's unit is to improve the services by using the specialist nurses. She has wonderfully portrayed this complex pathway starting from GP referral ending up with the treatment decision making with multiple visits and multiple branching out. This may be quite confusing, leave alone for a trainee, even for a consultant. It makes sometimes quite difficult to make sure the patient is in the correct pathway. And uh, Kelly and Mr. Viney during they have made the whole pathway into such a simple steps where 
first there will be a referral then there is a one stop clinic then joint decision making and once a decision is made patient will be diverted to medical treatment if not surgery if not urodynamics and further pathway so this is the exact thing what mr khan is trying to achieve with the one stop clinic which uh, kelly and uh, mr vaini during have nicely achieved it now what is the role of the clinical nurse specialist in this specific clinics they are very good as a first point contact for the patients and their families and uh, they will help to have the patient and the patient centered care they will be quite happy to discuss the information over the phone or in the face to face clinics they can sign post the patients to the appropriate care liaison with the gps they will be also helpful in trying to cover the emotional aspect of the patient's pathway this is the LUTS prostate assessment proforma i'm very sure they may have tried different proformas with made some modifications and um, finally came to a very nice comprehensive proforma these proformas will really help to keep the care to the topmost level and also it will help to train a new nurse specialist to get into the role quite quickly so the main services rendered by the clinical nurse specialist were assessing the patient symptoms say by using the ips score and they are getting signed off for the dre competencies and um, they also able to get verbal consent for various procedures available in the clinic urodynamics and urophlometry were always performed by the specialist nurses so this is not something new for them but apart from that they are able to do the post white scans also kelly and team has devised a very nice flow chart on how to measure the prostate trust volume and when i met her she has even shown me the charts which clearly says how to measure the length breadth and width of the prostate and uh, how it will be quite easy to decide which energy source to discuss with the patient and they have gone even to the level of discussing how to take further decisions like which energy source or which modality to choose and uh, in case if the patient wants to continue the medications to discuss various side effects of the medications so the clinical nurse specialist or almost they are doing the most of the job of a consultant like uh, deciding the medications types of surgeries deciding further investigations and discussing also the conservative management like uh, fluid advice bladder retraining pelvic floor exercise etc so this will be a eye opener and uh, this is where the future lies i am very sure the day will come where the one stop lutts clinic will be run completely by the clinical specialist nurse with consultant supervising them if mr during is online i will be very happy for him to add any um, thoughts on this but if mr during is not there we can um, include him during uh, his talk uh, vaini do you want to add anything on this please I am here. Hi. Yes. Yeah, so, thank you for presenting that. Yeah. The the joint clinic has been um, something that we've been working on for some time in in Wolverhampton. Most of the assessment is indeed done by the nurse specialist, but we will then um, all of the decision making is generally done by the consultant team. The nurse specialists are indeed able to uh, to to prescribe, but usually that's been done within consultation with us as a consultant body. So it, it's really um, helped to streamline our work and has allowed the consultants to focus their efforts on on decision making within the clinic rather than rather than the the initial assessment. Because as you, uh, the nice uh, graphic demonstrated. Will often have or uh, like a tabular format of their symptoms, whether they be storage or voiding. Um, we'll have um, a, a, a prostate volume assessment given to us, a flow rate given to us, and then we can just simply make decisions with regard to uh, 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 decision making. When it comes to consenting and seeing the patients uh, uh, for surgical treatments, those patients are all again seen by by the consultant body. But it's just about streamlining the process, and much as Fard says. trying to get all of this in a in a one stop type scenario thank you vaini that's very very helpful and uh, i'm very sure we will invite uh, sister kelly on one of our future sessions also uh, next there is a slight change in the order zishan aslam is the consultant from scotland he is the one who has got uh, quite an in depth 
the experience in visiting various developing countries, especially in Africa, not only in setting up these BPH surveys and also he has trained them in TURP and uh, other modalities. He has got a quite nice niche of running the services with uh, less investment. Uh, Zishan, please join us and we are quite eagerly looking for your tips and tricks in setting up. Thank you very much, uh, Ananda. Uh, shall I just share my screen? Where is it gone? Yeah, great. Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Ananda, for, um, for inviting and all the IQ team. It's, uh, it's an absolute honor to be part of this and to have uh, been the company of so many uh, specialists in this field. Uh, so, uh, my name is Zishan Aslam, conservative neurological surgeon in Nine Wells Hospital. And uh, I, my own practice is mostly revolving around renal cancer work in NHS and affiliations with Royal College Glasgow and uh, Edinburgh as well. But I do have my more experience of male nurses is overseas compared to uh, UK now as a consultant. So uh, we're just gonna talk about how, what I have experienced so far uh, with these services overseas, uh, especially in relation to Sub-Saharan Africa. That's where uh, my experience has been with this. Uh, so I have, uh, uh, my experience uh, first was with BAUS uh, in Ethiopia. It's a BAUS project, British Association of Neurological Surgeons, where as a resident, I did two visits and one as a consultant. Uh, in Senegal, I uh, started with an American charity and now I'm myself take, uh, taking on that as a project lead for developing laparoscopic Urology, a project under Royal College Surgeons Edinburgh, we have done and have restarted workshops now. And uh, just soon later this year, we will start our work in Liberia. Um, and that's again, uh, it has bigger objectives, but that will start with endoscopic urology. Again, a project which I have got accreditation with Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, which has a huge uh, good global surgery interest. Uh, in Pakistan, I've mostly involved in with our national organization as an executive committee member, and it's developing laparoscopic urology in various centers because we think that Pakistan is uh, slightly behind in laparoscopy where it should be. Uh, so uh, before we, uh, the talk will be mostly about um, endoscopic uh, urology with outlet blood outlet surgeries. Uh, so before uh, we just talk about those experiences, I really want to bring to attention this Lancet Commission report um, which was published in 2015, which was a huge eye opener um, with regards to global surgical needs. And anyone interested in uh, in global surgery, uh, I would recommend to have a look at that. Um, and that has it's a, it's a big report, but a couple of points, uh, very obvious point, was that about one bill, five billion people they do not have access to safe, affordable surgical care and anesthesia care. And clearly that is more so in low income and low middle income countries. And up to nine out of 10 people cannot access even basic surgical care. So that's like what 80% of the world population. 143 million surgical procedures are needed in LMICs, low middle income countries each year, life saving and disability preventing procedures. And uh, again, you can imagine the magnitude of the need. Just, just imagine a war where we, we, we lose, uh, we lose like, we, we, we are nowhere near to losing 143 million people in a year, but that is what we are losing for basic surgical procedures every year. And mostly again in Southeast Asia and, uh, and, and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa where the need is most. That article wasn't really about just urology, but everything and mostly it's to do with trauma and general surgery, emergency general surgery. So uh, Professor Neville Harrison, um, uh, a, a generation of uh, British urologies, which we were, we, which our generation was like not lucky enough to have seen them during their days uh, working. So he was founder member of Eurolink, British Bows charity um, organization. And he had uh, uh, mentioned this model uh, for for the condition which every human in the in the world should have a right to, and these are the few conditions. And top of them is retention, and need is a catheter and surgical endoscopic treatment. Right. So that was way back in two thousand and two. Right. It's not just surgical treatment, but endoscopic treatment. So 
moving on further so with what are the common needs with regards to male uh, luts in 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 such setups that mostly surgery is there but it's mostly open simple prostatectomies and a lot of time most of the time is general surgeons who work as urologists there are few units um, which have endoscopic blood outlet surgery available and uh, obviously just knowing systems for example nigeria where i have colleagues even there where it's it's uh, surgical capabilities are a bit more advanced but again uh, many centers do not have uh, endoscopic surgeries um no dedicated lutz clinic no specialist urologists as general surgeons uh, uh do this procedure and nurses uh we'll talk more about that about the about whether it is realistic to have all that uh clearly formal training programs are not in every uh country uh and uh, lack of resources we can all um, clearly imagine so what setting up such services what should be the short term of short to intermediate term objectives right so we have to be very mindful of the of the resources uh the dynamics of the population right population can be huge covered by a single hospital so what are we always be way, uh, be uh, aware that we are not there to replicate the western system that is unrealistic that's not going to lead to success you just have to think about surgical services lutz clinic audit research and what you can focus on and the objective is to make lives of individuals better which means that you yes surgical services is important you save lives chronic retention can lead to renal failure and um, worse consequences so the need is catheter or trp uh, and you have to have this realistic approach right if you have 10 pounds to spend i would rather save 10 lives than giving a a, a specialist service to a uh, super specialist service to two people from that so this is something that has to be really uh, really balanced working in these these circumstances so senegal is among the most established centers in sub saharan africa which i know uh, which i know of and my involvement is with laparoscopic project and they have as you can see some equipments for urodynamics flow rates uh, trust machine you can just see but even there uh, a, a dedicated lutz clinic uh, is not i am i am aware of um so but but they have up and running endoscopic uh, endoscopic urology services both upper tracts and lower tracts as well um so this is uh, we are going to talk about ethiopia which is bulk of my experience in in um on the horn in the, in, in the eastern part of uh, africa as you would all know that this hospital hawasa referral hospital in southern ethiopia which is about 500 beds uh, the one university hospital which covering about 20 million populations uh, that's like population of uh, london there are a few other hospitals but a specialized referral hospital and 15 about 15 urology bed approximately and it's been running for about 20 years so this project uh, uh, was is basically a bows uh, project uh, mr shaker bayani many of you would know him he initiated that and it's to what i have seen with bows in last 7 years uh is the most like successful project uh, running um with with efforts from subhani and and team and uh, endoscopic procedures were done in the initial phase equipment was all set up and there were workshops going on between 2014 just for laying the foundation so i did two visits in 2015 and 16 and that was in finally a resident and uh, those were it's almost nostalgic uh, preparing this presentation and going back through all that uh, all that stuff on my laptop so this is dr abera who is a general surgeon now retired and he had done spent some time in india in urology and that was his vision to develop urology service in southern ethiopia this is mr watson who my accompanied he works for bows as well as his own charity and an absolute uh, legend of british urology and gatch is was our resident then who is now a consultant and is the main man uh so um objectives uh, were uh, training into your peers during those visit visits initiate audit work if we could do and uh, preparation starts from anti malarials and yellow fever vaccinations to equipment collection and this is always uh, a part which is useful and enjoyable um any any um uh, expired stuff in 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 uk practice 
that, that it, it's easily used there. I mean, so expired superfluid uh, catheter is not going to cause any harm. Obviously, it, it's, it's just a date at the packaging time of it. Uh, but more importantly than that is the reuse, uh, the uh, reuse of the disposables. And um, this is always remains a very debatable topic about taking the, uh, the disposable loops, rolly balls with us because we throw them here, but they can be used multiple times and can be really, really life saving um, and, and important. And it's almost hurting to see when you work in these, this such environment to see how much uh, we can save. And Mr. Ma uh, Mr. Watson has to his charity uh, kind of got into a contract that he could would be able to use these and take them with with Africa, and I think um, a lot of us are a lot of uh, um, people can donate to him uh, through his charity send his stuff to Africa. So practice in two thousand five was TRs were done in dextrose early stages of training. Small prostates were being done. These WHO checklists, two epi checklists, they were all in getting routine use. Uh, mostly, Cydex was used for instrument sterilization, uh, instrument cleaning, I would say, and reusing of guide wires, Alex loops, rolly balls. That was all a very common uh, uh, practice. This was uh, the theater uh, that we have in Hawassa. I think recently uh, they've got a new new theater. Uh, I haven't visited for five, five years. Uh, Anesthetic nurses, they provide anesthetic services and doing a fantastic job. And they always do procedures in spinal. It's easy for them to uh, to manage that post-operatively and works really well for them. Um, this was our corridor with the, with, with the washing area. And you can imagine um, uh, reusable drapes are being used because of cost effectiveness. And um, this picture basically shows that the, the doors of the theaters open and sometimes windows as well. And that's basically the ventilation mechanism uh, that we had uh, during during those days. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so we from a from a other equipment point of view, you can just see uh, a full stack is um, at least up to 2017s was not uh, 17 was not available. Uh, but again, uh, that's that's a secondary thing I would invest on. I would invest on more prior things uh, before that. Uh, so one-to-one -one training, and you can see uh, Mr. Watson training the resident now, a consultant there. So these are uh, circumstances which has got its own challenges. Uh, for example, during a TRP electric shutdown, no generator backup. So, and then there's a three to four minute lapse of restarting the equipment. Uh, IV infusion sets were used for irrigation and obviously that does not give the same flow of irrigation. Diathermy could malfunction on and off in between. Uh, irrigant could be lacking, three-way catheters could be lacking and these are the stuff like three-way catheters which we always try to take with us. TURP loops, we have talked about how they can be deficient. Um, operating wise, poor views uh, could be an issue you come across, especially when we are dealing with very large prostate and that's what a number of those 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 uh, those prostates uh, were like. So um, yes, uh, conditions were have always uh, you would come across less than ideal, but it's not that you cannot really work them through and that's where adaptability uh, and resilience come through and that that trains you as a if, as a surgeon i talk about in a in a different way um, right then when, when you come back to your routine practice everything seems uh, very a lot more simpler as a resident i got opportunity to do this transvasical prostatectomy this is me holding the prostatic lobes wearing the bicycle headlamps to get a better view within the pelvis and you can just see that this is a glove that is being used as a drain and this is something which is uh, unique because we don't really uh, do these procedures at all um, um, uh, yeah so that that was that's a unique experience you will always get um, and this is again, uh, I think our UK trainees here can relate themselves to, and this really helps uh, as a trainee with Mr. Watson just filling an assessment, confirming I had supervised like 30, 13 or 14 procedures. So that that was really acknowledged at the time of my final signing off uh, ARCP. That was just February 2016 when I was signed off, so that was very timely. So this is another thing which I flavored as a as a trainee and was advantageous. And then as a consultant, uh, I was a year one consultant. My colleague Gatch was a year one consultant there, and we did this this sign off uh, trip. Um, in October 2017, and between this uh, 2014 to 17, we had consistent trips um, by myself as well and other colleagues uh, uh, for for Eurolink as well, where we just 
found that this is satisfactory and no more PRP workshops are needed there. And now uh, I think there's more focus on euthoplasty and stone disease. So outcomes wise, this is something I always would talk about that you doing a PRP and what, how would you determine an outcome in that kind of a situation? Would you check post white residuals? It's unlikely that you would always have a functioning machine and it's unlikely uh, that you, that would be done. And would we do self catheterization if patients have high residuals and advise them once it is self? This is completely unrealistic. And I remember in my last workshop, um, um, one of our colleagues was quite adamant on doing post viral residuals. Uh, I think he was more interested in looking the outcomes. And that's what the local surgeon says that it, it doesn't work here. Here, patient comes in, not passing urine, and goes home passing urine. And again, routine follow-up is not really realistic. They come from two, maybe 150 miles away from the hospital. And why this is all not possible? Because resources are limit, right? You don't have such clinics. Uh, you don't have nursing staff to back that up. And then you have to go into communities if you work in these circumstances. And that's me just reaching out in the communities. That's a Wondoganet village about, about 30 miles from where we work. And and you have to be realistic. Imagine a patient coming, living in these uh, these, these kind of uh, roof, these, these these huts, and asking them to do self catheterization before going to the bed, right? So this is like a completely unrealistic model. Their point of contact could be this primary health care, uh, which is um, uh, where they can make um, any if they have any problems, they can contact them, and they are fairly well trained. <clears throat> if anyone is interested, just read up on Ethiopian Health, Health Extension Workers Program, which is one of the best primary care in Sub-Saharan Africa. So realistic models does work. Uh, so clinics, it's almost impossible looking at the amount of patients that you have. Uh, and I think presenting them in an IPSS questionnaire, they, uh, they, they won't really grasp, they won't really grasp the whole concept of that. So basic services to start with would be to provide them with with large services. And this, especially in the context of Ethiopia with such a huge population. I always take pride of starting some audit work there in 2015 minutes. And this was captured um, very secretly by Mr. Watson. Um, our discussion is still found some spreadsheet of that about TRP versus TVP, uh, transvesical prostatectomy audit. And soon after the last workshop, um, uh, this, this um, I mean, a, a summary report was presented in BJUI and we have got our local surgeons there and, and you can also see some residents um, with, with whose names were clearly better sounding than my name. So yeah, so they are there on the paper, but more importantly, you can just see here uh, by 2017, uh, it had started to overlap, TRP overlapping the uh, TVPs, right? So that was a, a, a huge, very happy moment. And then TRP is up and running. So messages wise, perseverance, hats off to Mr. Bayani, Shekhar Bayani for persevering with that. And until a bigger team developed, regular workshops, right equipment, adequate case load, and a colleague at appropriate level to be trained uh, with a specialist dedicated Lux uh, clinic, whether this is possible, I don't think so uh, in, a, in, a, in a setup like Ethiopia with such a huge population, maybe in smaller uh, populated countries, right? And um, with the dynamics of the population, it's very difficult. They would always even follow the instructions to take home with, All right? So UK visit would always help. And my colleague Gatch visited us in 2019, I think, and we have shown him around and he just just to grasp whatever he can grasp for here and which is practically implementable in in ethiopia so that was about it and another modification which mr watson has introduced in gambia ethiopian other african countries is this bipolar trp with saline making machine using that which is a formula where it's like mixing one liter of water with nine grams of saline and boiling it uh, and then that that's that's basically 0.9 percent saline and works works perfectly. He did an audit in Gambia as well, and there were no infections or any other issues. So, and you can, and you are dealing with obviously very large prostate. So that helps even further with bipolar, uh, bipolar, uh, bipolar T or P. Uh, right. So uh, very quickly, Ananda, do we have time? Two more minutes. So shall I stop? Um, uh, yes, Zijan. Yeah. Take a minute, please. 
Okay, great. So, so this was about a uh, brief experience. Um, I could talk a lot more about that. And so this is a project which I have set up with the uh, uh, John F. Kennedy Medical Center in Monrovia, Liberia, where is this one urologist, my colleague who trained in general surgery and now fellowship in Senegal, which qualifies him as a urologist, 5 million population. Uh, and they have got uh, JFK as the main hospital serving people. Luckily, there's a lot of WHO, World Bank, USA, Gates Foundation involvement. So they have procured equipment already from very good, good quality, affordable price from India. And hoping that we, this is Royal Quality Accreditation. We are hoping to travel in September. The same history is repeating with all the equipment that I've already started to collect. And uh, hopefully we will be a wider objectives, but start with endoscopic development first. Thank you, Anand. And sorry, I think I may have taken a bit more time. Well done, Zishan. That's a very nice job. I think anybody who has seen your presentation should at least stop complaining the practice what is happening in UK. Here we are um, suffering from the disease of surplus and uh, we are moaning and complaining for the drop of the hat. But you have achieved with your team something which is uh, not manageable so easily. There are so many learning points and uh, I hope we will get another opportunity to present the audits to see how this uh, self-made indigenous uh, saline machine has no major impact like infections and the outcome is almost similar. Thank you, Zishan. That's very, very kind of you joining us. Next, we have Thank the presentation you. from uh, Mr. Iqbal Shargil. He's uh, Professor Shargil. His presentation is on GRIFT. For those who don't know, GRIFT is a kind of um, guidelines and which is very specific to every institute. The aim is to get it right in the first time. The team of GRIFT has traveled all over the UK to find the lacunas and to spread the learnings from one unit to another unit, try to even the availabilities and disadvantages in some units. And I've spoken to many units in the UK where just because of the GRIFT visit, they had the opportunity to get the green light and they have opportunity to start the transperineal biopsies, etc. So GRIFT has made a major impact and let's see what Professor Shergill has in his sleeves. Hello, my name is Professor Iqbal Shergill. I'm a consultant neurological surgeon here in Wrexham and also um, treasurer elect for uh, British Association of Neurological Surgeons, BAUS, uh, as well as BAUS trustee. Sincerest apologies for not being able to attend this uh, webinar in person, uh, but unfortunately uh, had a pre-arranged um, rendezvous in Paris uh, for an important uh, event. Getting it right first time, or GERFT, is an NHS program which is designed to improve the quality of care within the NHS by reducing unwarranted variation. Essentially, by uh, tackling this variation in the way services are delivered across the NHS and by sharing best practice between trusts, GERFT then can identify changes that will help improve care and patient outcomes, uh, as well as uh, delivering efficiencies such as the reduction of unnecessary procedures and cost savings. Urology was a very early GERFT specialty and work was done over several years uh, across the whole of the NHS England and a national report was then published which we'll discuss. Subsequently, after review by Gerft and Baus, implementation uh, was initiated and then continued until the pandemic. The 2018 Gerft National Specialty Report on Urology uh, demonstrated quite clearly a wide variation in practice across the NHS and uh, highlighted the need for improvement in uh, urological practice in a range of areas. Uh, the recommendations are listed in the next two slides. So with respect to GERFT methodology, the starting point in the quality improvement process is the recognition that some aspects of care are suboptimal. While this, while this is uh, apparent to some of those who are delivering services, the GERFT methodology of data analysis and clinically led conversations with frontline staff definitively demonstrated that we can all do better. The GERFT 
Best Practice Academy aims to identify good practice and provide guidance on service improvement, particularly focusing on common conditions and frequent interventions, thereby maximising impact. The GERFT Academy developed this guide on the management of bladder outflow obstruction to support the implementation of good practice. Importantly, this comes at a time when the management of this common condition is both improving and getting more complex. The guide describes the key features of a contemporary and comprehensive bladder outflow obstruction service and acts as a guide for teams who are committed to high quality care. Importantly, it will also aid the identification of potential gaps in the current service and offer practical advice that will then help the multidisciplinary team. To... Several key points are raised in the executive summary as outlined here. We will go through some of these in the next few slides. The bladder outlet obstruction pathway covers the various modes of presentation for men with problematic urinary symptoms with the aim not to overcomplicate. It gives guidance on first presentation, what urological services should be providing, as well as discharge and follow-up recommendations. The four broad categories are painful acute urinary retention, chronic urinary retention, botherless, bothersome LUTs, and then red flag symptoms. In this pathway, guidance is also given regarding one-stop assessment, as well as all the different modern and contemporary treatment options which may be available. A few of the components of high quality blood outflow obstruction care uh, will be outlined in the next few slides, uh, demonstrating good practice in blood outflow obstruction pathway. With respect to managing patients in a timely manner to improve patient outcomes and experience, several key quality actions were listed. One of the examples that were given in the document, including waiting list management using SMS messaging from Southampton. With respect to providing a one-stop service for patient assessment, um, two key centres in Imperial College and also in Scotland have shown significant improved efficiencies in uh, one-stop outpatient clinic assessment of male patients with low intrac symptoms. Well, providing high quality information to patients is important and um, recommendations are to review the portfolio of patient information that's available and ensure that patient decision aids are available to facilitate discussions. Importantly, uh, national bodies such as BAUS are at the forefront of this and are leading on uh, this key quality action point. Furthermore, offering a comprehensive range of treatment options within a urology area network is critical here uh, for, for patients. Um, the days of every surgeon providing every treatment are gone and are not efficient anymore. Uh, what's clear is that um, in a specific area network, the expertise should be harnessed, for example, referral to whole lip surgeons or referral to resume surgeons or Eurolift surgeons. Finally, the importance of maximizing the use of day surgery and improved recovery pathways. Day case surgery is here and many of the BPH treatments which we'll hear about today can be offered as day case surgery. Furthermore, patients with catheter in situ need to have options and availability for early catheter removal um, after surgery, for example. So in summary, GERFT, or get it, getting it right first time, is an NHS program which is designed to improve quality of care within the NHS by reducing unwarranted variation. And in simple terms, it could be used in all clinical practice um, throughout the world uh, to tackle variation in the way services are delivered and then by sharing best practice uh, between centres. Um, GERFT is quite confident that it will identify changes that will improve uh, patient care and patient outcomes, as well as delivering efficiencies, such as the reduction of unnecessary procedures and cost savings. Many thanks for uh, your time and attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shargil. That's a very, very useful presentation. Uh, if I want to think something like uh, what is the implication of this GERF-related discussion in the countries like India, 
Uh, I know the private practice is different and every urologist wish to master every possible technology and we don't want a patient to get ended up in our neighboring units. But if you take to the government setups, this GERFT setup and this urology area network will be a very useful tool so that if there are two, three government hospitals uh, close by, one of them can take care of BPH, the other one can take care of prostate cancers and this will help to improve the individual specialist um, in the learning curve and also get the best possible care for the patient. I'm sure the um, policymakers in the countries like India and Pakistan, when they review this presentation, it will be a game changing for them. Next in the lineup, we have the presentation from uh, one of my very close friend and also previously a trainee now, uh, urology consultant, uh, Dr. Anish Pushkaran. He is going to discuss on the role of fellowships. The days where the patients or the trainees will concentrate on everything under the sun is gone. Once they get trained into the main systems, then it's important for them to get the fellowship to get themselves into like a specialist in the benign prostate, specialist in the incontinence, etc. He is going to share his view because he has completed his fellowship in the holmium enucleation of the prostate and mainly of the benign prostate surgeries. Let's see what Hanish has. Hi everyone, welcome to this webinar where I'm going to discuss the fellowships in male lower urinary tract symptoms. This is a recorded video as I'm currently in Turkey attending the EAU Technology Conference. I was so delighted when Mr. Dhanesh Shagorin offered me to present this topic, which is very close to my heart as I was fortunate enough to be part of an excellent Holub Fellowship in the country. I shall divide this topic into three sections. Uh, first part is the importance of fellowship in urology training. The second part, I will take you through my own experience in fellowship training. The third part, I will share the pearls I learned and the checklist that you need before applying for fellowship training. So coming to the first part, one of the questions frequently asked is why you need a fellowship? So we know that there is enough evidence in the literature to prove that fellowship training programs improves the surgical outcomes. Also, if you are trained specifically in a surgical skill, there's a good chance that you can master the procedure. You will have the potential to become an authority in that field. And who knows, you might even invent an intervention which might be the most efficient and the minimally invasive in male lower, lower urinary tract symptoms. Other question asked was when you should do your fellowship. Definitely this should be after the basic training. Just after completing the basic training would be ideal, but I would say that there is no time limit for a fellowship training because the field of male LUTs is evolving continuously. So whenever you want to learn a new skill that has got a significant learning curve, then that is the right time to get a fellowship training. So you should aim to get your fellowship training in a high volume center. Make sure that their caseload is proportional to the learning curve of that particular surgical skill. You should make sure that the mentors are confident in mentoring you. What you don't want is a mentor standing behind you, being nervous in each millimeter of your instrument movement. They should have the knowledge to avert any wrong step sufficiently early enough. And they should have enough experience to get you back from any difficult situation during training. And how should you approach a fellowship? You have to think about a subspeciality that is attractive enough for you to dedicate at least a year of additional training and commitment. Realize that the skill that you learn today might be obsolete in 10 years time. You, so you have to constantly adapt. When you go for a, a fellowship training, have a realistic expectation about the learning curve. In my experience, it was very true to the statistics because I expected my learning curve to be exponential because I was in OES. But when I extrapolate my graph after my training, it was the classic sigmoid shape. Coming to the second part of this topic, the question is, what is the importance of fellowship in male lower urinary tract symptoms, LUTs scenario? Most of the minimally invasive surgery for male LUTs 
have a learning curve of ranging from 10 to 15 cases. And this applies to Eurolift and Resume. Um, I don't have a first-hand knowledge on Accoblation, iTint, Euroloom, Xflow or Butterfly, so I'm not commenting on those. Traditionally, we know that TURP had a learning curve of between 50 to 75 cases for a surgeon to do it independently and confidently with few complications. And most of us will agree that recently, TURP is falling out of favor to enucleation techniques. It is due to the better amount of tissue removed that results in better long-term outcomes. Any LUTs procedure that needs about 50 cases to achieve that learning curve plateau needs fellowship training. So in male LUT spectrum, the enucleation procedures need a fellowship training. Two enucleation energy sources were described previously, bipolar and laser. But as you know, the bipolar enucleation is falling out of favor. If you refer to the EAU 2022 guidelines, you can see that the bipolar enucleation for prostate is given a weak evidence. At the same time, the evidence rating is strong for laser enucleation process. Also, there are at least two good RCTs that says homium laser enucleation has better outcome compared to bipolar enucleation. HOLEP is considered to be the most versatile of male LUTs procedures because if you have to learn one skill that can cover all sizes of prostate, then learning the laser enucleation will make that difference. You don't have to worry about the size of the prostate once you learn HOLEP. You can focus on the patient, his IPSS, flow rate and bladder scan, and if needed on bladder diary, flexible cystoscopy and urodynamics as appropriate. I'm happy to share my experiments with fellowship training. I have been in good and bad fellowships. I started with a bad experience because of my naivety, because I was excited to be part of a fellowship program. I didn't do my homework, didn't pay a visit to that hospital before I applied. I didn't ask much about that fellowship during my interview because obviously I was excited. I took things for granted. I thought getting that fellowship itself is a blessing and I should agree that I was carried away by the name of the institute. I can't blame anyone else for that, but just me. So. Without wasting my time, I left the place as soon as possible, just respecting all the contract agreements. So when I applied for the next fellowship, I was prepared well. Uh, by that time, I knew that my passion was to learn HOLEP. I looked around for a high volume center in HOLEP, spoke to lots of people in our fraternity, and I came to know about the Luton and Dunstable HOLEP Fellowship. And I knew that the mentors there were training consultants all over the country. So it was a big tick for me. During the interview, I realized that the team is doing more than 250 cases per year of HOLEP. There are two experienced mentors who has done more than 1600 cases between them. They have audited their work meticulously. There are two to three theater sessions per week. And most importantly, the HOLEP trainees theater sessions are protected. So if anyone else wants a hands-on on HOLEP, uh, the mentors would inform me beforehand and made sure that I was happy about it. And the team gave me freedom to talk to the waiting list coordinator to arrange the list so that my training went well. And during the training, I had an intraoperative checklist where in an Excel chart, I recorded all the objective and subjective data possible. The objective means the number of cases the volume of prostate, the time of enucleation, time of mosellation, the weight of enucleated tissue like that. And the subjective ones were my feel about the training, my confidence on the training, things like that. So to summarize, the take home stages are, you should have a checklist before applying for the fellowship. You should assess yourself, assess what is your passion and see if that surgical skill needs more than 50 cases to achieve the proficiency. In that case, it needs a fellowship training. Take your time and search for the best fellowship. Search around, talk within your specialty. And once you shortlist some programs, speak with the people who has been through that fellowship before. Speak to at least three to avoid any bias and focus on one or two of those fellowships and talk to the mentors of those fellowships. Ask about how many cases they do per year, how many cases they have done so far, have they audited their outcomes, and most importantly, is your fellowship training theaters protected? And extrapolate to see if you can do at least 100 cases in a period of one year.
If everything ticks, then apply for the fellowship. And year mark six to 12 months to learn that skill. Nothing else matters during that time. And once you are in the team, it is important that you have to have a good rapport with the team. You should have an excellent professional relationship with the team, your mentors, the other consultants, secretaries, nurses, junior doctors, most importantly, rota coordinator and the waiting list coordinator. Um, coffee and toffees might help, but the most important thing is your harmony within the team. If you want to know more about uh, Luton and Dunstable Hospital Hall of Fellowship, I'm happy to give you more information. I'll leave my email at the, in the description of this video. Best wishes. Thank you, Anish. That was a very nice presentation. And um, I, I'm pretty sure this will be useful not only for the aspiring students who wish to find out which is the best possible fellowship and also it will be also useful for those who are mastering and running the fellowship courses to decide how to run a fellowship, what is the expectation of the fellows who are applying for the courses. Whenever I try to attend any meetings in countries like India, people usually ask me during the coffee break or the lunch break asking about what fellowships I do or I have in my hospital or what are all the other fellowships available in the country. I'm quite happy and in the past I have guided many people to join the fellowships of their interest but I'm sure the day has come the countries like India and Pakistan should be able to tailor the fellowships on their own and I'm very sure Anish presentation will give an overall idea about uh, what a fellowship means and how to construct a good fellowship and what a fellowship aspirant should be looking for. Next presentation is another very interesting one. I come across uh, Dr. Neil Barber's this presentation one year back when we had a BPH summit in London. It was a wonderful presentation portraying various newer energy sources and newer modalities available for the prostate treatment. I know for the countries like India and Pakistan and African countries, the energy sources like Eurolift and Resume is still not very reachable. But apart from those energy sources, there are so many new things in the uprising trend. He has picked up some very recent updates from the AUA 2022. So those who have missed AUA, here is the chance. Let me share his presentation. I'd like to thank uh, Archie for the kind information, uh, the kind invitation to speak today uh, at this year's meeting and indeed for last year's uh, and uh, to give the opportunity to uh, talk about the future trends in BPH treatment, a quick run through really and the current options and those in the future. Uh, my name is Neil Barber, I'm a urologist in the UK and I've been lucky enough to be involved uh, in pretty much most new technologies that they've evolved over, evolved over the last 20 years. So where are we in 2022? Well, essentially, I think we can group those options in, into two sections, uh, those which are so-called cavitating or receptive treatments and the so-called minimally invasive surgical treatments. In that cavitating arm, we see some familiar options, including the TURP and its bipolar or plasma uh, newer version. The enucleation techniques using the holmium laser or thulium laser or even green light laser as well as the green light laser vaporization technique. We know that these are good operations, that they achieve significant improvement in IPS and flow rate and have low intervention rates, uh, re-intervention rates over a, a long period of time. But we also know their downsides, including the requirement often for inpatient stay, for a post-operative urinary catheter requiring in many cases irrigation. And we also understand the perioptive uh, complications and that they inevitably carry some delay in symptom resolution and therefore return to normal activities. And we're particularly aware of their potential negative impact upon sexual function as regards both development of dry ejaculation and some negative impact upon erectile function. Into this group, I think we're now seeing the arrival of aquablation of the prostate using the aquabeam system. Indeed, one could argue now that 2022 is the year in which aquablation really comes of age uh, in terms of its place within this group as a viable alternative to those standard approaches, which uh, the newest of which is nearly 20 years old now. 
So what is aquablation? Aquablation is the only image-guided, heat-free, automated robotic therapy for BPH, employing real-time image guidance, that is through a transrectal ultrasound probe, uh, personalized planning, uh, and automated robotic execution. Uh, and of course, uniquely, it uses a heat-free water jet to remove and ablate tissue to create a wide cavity through the prostate and disobstruct the outlet. There is both endoscopic and ultrasound view of the prostate. The software then allows you to plan uh, the uh, treatment based upon that person's particular shape of prostate, including middle lobes. And indeed, there are five zones within the algorithm, which really give the surgeon quite a lot of control in terms of deciding how to treat that individual's prostate. Why do I say it's come of age? Well, this year saw the publication of the five-year outcome data from the water study. That was a global, prospective, double-blind, randomized trial versus TURP. And we've seen a, a sustained uh, improvement in symptoms in terms of improvement IPSS, as well as the other uh, variables. Uh, and this is as good as the TURP in the arm, and indeed in the 50 to 80 mil uh, group of, of size prostates within that trial, an ever so slight uh, advantage to the application over the TURP. We overlay it here with the outcome from the other trials that have been done, that is WALTER2, which was a prospective multi-center trial in the US looking at prostate volumes to 80 to 150 mils. The open water study, which is a multi-center trial in Europe, uh, which was uh, uh, off-label uh, and real world in the sense that there was very minimal exclusion criteria. And I haven't laid on here the French study as well, but we see the same kind and same level of improvement in symptoms across all those trials. As I say, we now know that will last out to five years and therefore can say that uh, aquablation does have long-term benefit. And we see how that benefit is different from both that we would look to see with drug therapy and with the so-called non-receptive or invasive surgical treatments. The outcomes are definitely in the same range as an ablative or receptive, sorry, as a receptive or cavitating procedure. The retreatment rate in that uh, water trial over the five years was 1% per year, aquablation, which in fact was ever so slightly better than the TURP arm. If you put all that data together and do a meta-analysis, uh, then of the, those studies plus the French study, we have over 400 men with prostate volumes ranging from 20 to 150 mils. And we see these big improvements in IPSS, flow rate and quality of life score. But these are all achieved uh, with a 10.8% a chance of developing dry ejaculation and apparently no impact upon erectile function. So this is the unique selling point really of aquablation and that it can treat all sizes of prostates with a significantly lower risk of negative impact on sexual function compared to the standard uh, operations. What about the minimally invasive surgical treatment group then? Well, we know about Urinift, Resume and ITIND uh, that I discussed last year and I won't touch on PAE uh, because of time. Um, but we know that the attraction of the Eurolift, Resume, and ITIN group is that they can be performed as day case or in the office under local anaesthetic or some sedation. A number of them don't need a catheter or have a low risk of requiring one. And they are said to allow a more rapid return to normal activities with little or, or no impact on sexual function, be it in terms of ejaculation or erectile function. But there is a cost to that. We know that their improvement in symptom and flow is not that of a cavitated procedure, but still twice as good as one would expect with medication. But of course, there are questions regarding the durability of these procedures uh, compared to the standard approaches. Eurolift now uh, is well established with data range, uh, with good data demonstrating efficacy with prostates up to 80 mils. And in a number of countries, there's authorization to treat prostates up to 100 mils. We've seen publications confirming the technique can be applied to those with middle loads using advanced approaches. And indeed, there is some uh, new, there was a new handpiece which is coming out, which is out in the States, I should say, which makes that somewhat easier. And I also tend to use a slightly modified approach in those men with very small prostates, but high type planar necks. We also have data for multi-centered trial in the UK confirming efficacy in men in retention, with about 80% or so being catheter-free at the end of the year. Uh, this is the five-year data from the original trial against sham for the FDA with retreatment rates of 2 to 3% per year. But we uh, probably accept that it's slightly higher than that in the real world. This year has seen multiple presentations comparing outcome data uh, from those uh, tightly controlled trials against uh, retrospective data collected from around the world of over two and a half thousand men. And we can see that that retrospective real world data reflects the data we've seen in the, in the uh, more tightly controlled trials, uh, both in men with obstructive lateral lobes, men with obstructive middle lobes, 
and indeed those of men in retention. Uh, and this is all achieved with zero negative impact on sexual function, be it ejaculation or erectile. And this high quality data, and particularly a prospective randomized trial against the standard of care in the form of TURP in the BPH6 trial, has meant that uh, Urinif finds itself in the standard algorithm for the, for the management of uh, the surgical management of uh, symptomatic BPH in the 2022 EAU guidelines, both as an option for men with 30 to 80 mil prostates and also for men who are not fit enough to undergo uh, general anesthesia and are looking for a local anesthetic option. So 2022 sees Eurolift become essentially in the EAU eyes part of the options of standard, part of the standard of care options uh, for men with symptomatic BPH. What about Resume? Well, Resume, as we know, uses steam to uh, ablate uh, the tissue within the prostate. And we uh, know that it has data relating to prostate volumes of 30 to 80 mils that you can treat the middle lobe. Uh, there is no uh, good quality data that is multi-centered data looking at men in urinary retention, although it's clearly it has been used to treat patients in such a situation, indeed, with larger prostate volumes. However, in the latest EAU guidelines, uh, they quote a Cochrane review which suggests the level of data we have uh, it has a certainty ranging from moderate to very low and reiterate that they really do need to see a, a prospective randomized trial against the standard of care for it to gain any more uh, secure place within that a standard of care algorithm that I outlined in the last slide. What data do we have then? Well, it's really just one data, that original pivotal study against sham for the FDA. And that did demonstrate good improvements in IPSS and uh, maximum flow rate in line with that from the Eurolift. And we've seen with four and then five year data that these outcomes are maintained. And we know that this is a relatively low retreatment rate, certainly compared to Eurolift, and maybe it's an advantage over that alternative. CLEAR is a uh, randomized, multi-centered global study of Eurolift versus Resume sponsored by Teleflex. And that's just in the recruitment phase now, particularly looking at the early recovery uh, following the procedure in terms of speed of getting back to normal activity and impact upon uh, quality of life, including sexual function. This may help to give us uh, some uh, high quality data versus what is now considered a standard of care in the form of Eurolift. ITIN. Uh, the temporary implantable nittle device, uh, a, procedure, uh, a device which sits uh, through the prostate and across the bladder neck, which is left in place for five to seven days. And during that time, uh, the uh, device expands, uh, making three longitudinal incisions through the prostate through pressure necrosis, essentially remodeling the bladder neck and the prostate to relieve obstruction. The device is moved under, removed under local anesthetic. And we know that from the data so far, that it doesn't have any impact upon sexual function, be it erectile or ejaculatory. There are a number of studies which have shown pretty much the same outcomes, particularly in terms of improvement in IPSS. And two of those studies now have three year data. Uh, and uh, at the early part of last year, following a prospective randomized trial against SHAM, uh, ITIN was given uh, the go ahead by the FDA. Uh, and we're soon to see the publication of a prospective non-randomized multi-centered European trial MTO2 uh, with six year uh, follow-up data, excluding those who have middle lobes uh, who are not suitable for this procedure. Again, the EO guidelines suggest that a randomized trial against the reference uh, standard is required to gain any further recognition in terms of guidelines. And MTO8, is, uh, which is exactly that, a randomized multi-centered trial versus Eurolift. Again, we see Eurolift seen as a standard of care uh, is uh, looking to get going. Uh, and this is sponsored by Olympus, who now have the rights to the ITIN device. So what's coming down the line? Well, there are also four other pivotal trials against uh, sham coming along for the FDA. Uh, the first is Optilume, uh, and we're just coming towards the first end of that trial, uh, which is called Pinnacle. And that's on the background of a first in man trials in Latin America, which demonstrated really quite uh, impressive improvements in IPS and flow rate, somewhat better than the other mists and approaching the, the outcome from the, the, the standard receptive and cavitating procedures, uh, uh, which is really quite remarkable. That trial was called the Everest trial. And remember, Optilume has been developed uh, to treat urethral strictures. It's a balloon with paclitaxel coating. Um, and we're very interested to see what that one year data from the Pinnacle trial is when it's released, I think later in this year. We also seen the rebirth of the prostatic stent. So the three other studies all relate to that. Firstly, Zenflow, 
uh, which is the zone flow spring, which is a not quite complete stent, if you like, that sits uh, in the mid prostate to relieve obstruction. Uh, the butterfly uh, looks to sort of reenact the effect of the urinif, holding the anterior urethra open, that's delivered through a rigid sheath. Uh, and Proverum, or the Pro-V stent, which is an Irish stent, which is a more 360 stent in terms of holding the whole prost mid prostate uh, open. As regards Zenflow, then we have the Zest, Zest EU studies which were presented. And this is um, first in man trials, if you like, in Australia and New Zealand with some familiar big names there in terms of Peter Gilling and Peter Chin being involved. High levels of successful deployment, pretty good improvements in IPSS and flow rate in line with those minimum invasive surgical treatments. The Bree study then, the, the, the randomized trial against Sham is now recruiting uh, and it will be a year or so before we see the first results of that. Similarly, the butterfly stent, which I mentioned earlier on, um, this, is a, this is a stent that has different sizes, um, and so the pros, uh, prostate length measurement is required to decide which size you want. It's deployed through a rigid cystoscope, and they presented uh, at the AUA and indeed the EAU first year the uh, outcome of the first in man trials in, in uh, Egypt, with similar kind of improvements uh, that we're seeing uh, with the minimally invasive surgical treatments. Proverium or the Pro-V stent has done again first in man studies in Australia and now the PRUVE study is looking to recruit that savanamized trial against sham for the FDA, 30 to 80 mil prostate, no middle lobes, so no middle lobes are not part of uh, what can be treated by this new family of prostatic stents. This one's made a nitinol and as I say expands in 360s to hold the whole, 360 degrees to hold the whole prostate open and again much like um, Zenflow, they have their own bespoke uh, flexible system delivery system to place the stent accurately. What other gizmos are there? Well, there's been a little chatter about um, the rebirth of other ways to ablate the, the prostate following the success of uh, Resume. So this is a transperineal um, uh, ultrasound guided laser abl interstitial laser ablation uh, piece of kit using a 300 micron diode laser. Uh, with one to two treatments per lateral lobe, under local anesthetic in the office with a bespoke transrectal ultrasound uh, guidance that's probe and guidance system as well as planning software and they're claiming some 40% reduction in prostate volume. We saw uh, the presentation, the first in man uh, trial in Italy at the EAU last year with 43 mil prostate on average in nine days with the catheter with reasonable improvements in both flow rate and IPSS, I think in line with the other uh, missed procedures and no impact upon sexual function. At the AUA, uh, just a week ago, uh, we saw a um, presentation of uh, some outcome data using this device from Miami of 20 men with prostate volumes ranging from 30 to 120 mils. And again, as you can see from this uh, photograph of the slide, uh, reasonable improvements in both IPSS and flow rate, but clearly much higher quality multi-centered and, and preferably randomized trials are required to really understand the role of this. Although, as we can see, uh, Resume is now leading to uh, interest again in, in many approaches in terms of ablating the prostate. Not least the MRI-guided transurethral laser ultrasound ablation. Uh, this uses a bespoke device uh, which is placed in the urethra and there are 10 sections to it. So in the MRI scanner, when you can identify the transition zone, you can then sculpt, if you like, the delivery of the ultrasound energy to ablate the prostate tissue to the shape of that um, transition zone. And it does, of course, require a rectal probe as well in terms of um, keeping an eye on temperature and potential damage towards the rectum. It's really quite slow uh, and procedure times are well over an hour or even two, but we do see in this very small trial from Scandinavia, a reasonable improvement in both um, IPSS flow rate and a reduction in prostate volume. And again, they describe little no impact upon sexual function. So where are we then for 2023 uh, in terms of the surgical options available? Beyond the ones that we saw last year in the minimum invasive surgical tre uh, treatment group, we're seeing trials for Optilume, the Zemphalo Spring, the Pro-V Stent and the Butterfly. And in the cavitating surgery or reception uh, treatment group, we see the arrival of aquablation with high quality and now long-term data in terms of uh, efficacy. If we move forward, what do I think is going to be uh, like to be big players in this field? Well, I think aquablation is now here to stay with this such good and high quality data and there are many attractive features to it, which I think are no doubt leading to increased interest and increased delivery in terms of numbers of patients around the world. As regards to new arrivals in the minimum invasive surgical treatment group, uh, the 
the early data related to Optidum really does make that very exciting. And this could be a real game changer in terms of uh, what options we have in this group going forward. Clearly, we await the data from that uh, Pinnacle trial uh, later in the year and longer term data as well. Uh, but I think that's the one to keep an eye on going forward. Again, many thanks for asking me to talk at this meeting. Uh, and um, it's been a pleasure to talk about these options. And I hope uh, everybody's learned something new. Thank you, Neil. That's uh, very useful. And um, it looks quite daunting on the amount of um, the energy sources which are on the pipeline and uh, uh, the things to do. And um, we can't believe that we are discussing this topic in 2022. If we date back to, say, two years back, we nobody will expect such a flurry of uh, energy sources available. Um, what do you think, Neil, your advice on a very uh, aspiring BPH surgeon? What is his next step? Say, for example, if they are doing uh, bipolar T, URP, maybe green light and uh, maybe resume and Eurolift, do you think it's time for them to jump into one of the new things or it's better for them to wait till they are nicely tested and uh, trialed? Um. Thank you, Alan. Um, I am a great believer in doing things properly and seeing the right kind of data sets and trials done. Uh, and I do think that whilst we rely heavily on industry in terms of performing these trials, because let's face it, nobody else would fund them, um, we should also be holding account to make sure that these trials are done. Um, and above anybody else, really, the EAU and the EAU guidelines seem to hold the highest kind of bar in terms of that requirement for your gain recognition within their algorithms. I'm not sure the same can be said for the AUA or even NICE, uh, who seem to be in a rush to adopt these new technologies. I think for us as surgeons, it's, uh, it's important that we do uh, hold the, the industry to account to make sure we get the right kind of data, because ultimately we're facing the patients and when we're offering them these different treatments, we need to know, A, uh, that we've got solid ground in which we're discussing them when we're comparing them to other options, particularly there's more and more available. Uh, and B, we need to make sure from our point of view that we understand really the ins and outs of each of these new things and where their place is in that treatment algorithm for that particular patient. I mean, I would agree that BPH is, with all these different options, is becoming an increasingly complicated field in terms of uh, having discussions with patients, particularly when you you're in a you know in, a, in the first world, maybe where you have uh, patients have knowledge of these things, they see them on the internet, it's all out there and in, in terms of social media, and you need to be well armed and fully informed, and indeed what could argue experienced uh, enough to have uh, the proper discussions with them. So I think primarily for people who aren't involved at the trial end of it, then you need to rely on the data out of high quality trials before you make sure that you're well trained and understand the ins and outs to have the proper discussions with people. Thank you, Neil. It is so difficult to find one person who is like a to-go person to get anything about the newer technology. And uh, thank you for being in this panel. Next, we have uh, one of my close friend, uh, Mr. Gokul Vignesh Kandaswamy. He's going to discuss on, is there any role for robotics, which is the big machine for the prostate? When um, Neil discussed the other end where how we can use some small clips or implants to treat the benign prostate. Gokul is bringing his uh, big trailer with a robot to see its role. Let's see what he has. Hi, good morning uh, and good afternoon. Uh, I'm Gokul Kandaswamy, one of the consultants in the UK. I'm sorry, I'm not there in person presenting this. Um, however, I thank the organizers and the moderators for the opportunity. I'm going to talk about the role of uh, robotic simple prostatectomy uh, at this present uh, day and age uh, as one of the treatment modality for uh, benign prostatic enlargement. Now, here you classify uh, all the surgical options, uh, which has gone leaps and bounds in the last decade. Uh, into five different um, uh, categories. The ideal treatment option, according to them, for volume of a gland below 80 grams is resection techniques, and glands above 80 grams is uh, enucleation techniques. Um, and if you look at the enucleation techniques, pretty much uh, all different forms of surgery that you know have a, um, a share of uh, 
their role in, in such a technique, which is quite understandable because uh, pathologically it is an adenoma that's developing and large glands are more likely to to an adenoma rather than um, other sort of dysfunctions contributing to the symptoms. And when adenoma is the pathology, then enucleating is the uh, is, is, is principally the right treatment choice. But do we have a consensus consensus of what is the right uh, treatment approach? The answer is no. Historically, open prostatectomy was thought to be the right choice, but even the resection technology has evolved and do have an enucleation uh, option with the bipolar TURP. And uh, the present uh, so-called uh, gold standard at the moment is considered to be the laser enucleation procedures. And EAU at the moment considers uh, robotic prostatectomy as an investigational procedure. Why should it be the case? Because uh, it is one of the youngest procedures described for such an indication. And uh, it was only 14 years since the first paper came out. But if you look at all the parameters described in the paper, it clearly is, uh, is an exceptional result for a procedure that has been reported for the first time. Um, but a number of uh, <coughs> in, uh, papers on simple prostatectomy robotically is fairly low given the volume of uh, cases that's across the world and that's probably one one of the reason why it's considered investigation and now surgically it is exactly similar to an open surgery but the only difference is we are doing it with a robotic approach than uh, cutting open someone's tummy and in fact the robotic approaches have even evolved uh, using single port surgery or uh, even uh, doing a tran intrafacial um, approach similar to a, um, a radical prostatectomy. <clears throat> now, surgery is exactly similar to radical robotic prostatectomy in terms of positioning, anesthesia, etc. And uh, once we reach the bladder, we either go transvesical or um, transcapsular. Um, the transvesical approach seems to be the predominant type of uh, if you look at literature and here once your bladder is open we straight away go to six o'clock position securing the uvas and entering between the right plane once we open up the mucosa uh, if required we remove the median lobe first if not uh, once we enter the plane we just go all around keeping prostate capsule as the landmark so that we stay in the right plane all the time a key thing to remember surgically is that you know sometimes extends beyond the urethra junction and hence it needs to be entirely removed and keeping this anatomical variation in mind. Once the hemostasis is done, then we reconstruct the bladder neck, either circumferentially to narrow it down or to pull it down towards the prostate apex to retrigonize the um, uh, part of the bladder. And finally, we leave a three-way catheter in. And the intrafacial uh, surgery is essentially a radical prostatectomy approach where we don't go between the adenoma and the peripheral zone, we basically just go outside the prostate capsule, but within the prostate fascia, thereby preserving all the neurovascular uh, bundle, which is outside the prostatic fascia, so that the erections uh, and continence are maintained well. Uh, advantages, we don't have to worry about uh, three-way catheter and irrigation. At the same time, the fear of uh, missing a prostate cancer or following a prostate or prostate cancer in the future is also negated with this approach. And it has been reported um, five years ago as one of the modalities of uh, choice. The robotic platforms have ev even evolved and even the single port um, uh, Da Vinci platform cases have been reported. And once again, if you look at all the numbers and the outcomes, they are very comparable to um, other surgical techniques as clearly even the novel surgical platforms to offer a, a, a treatment choice for these uh, patients. So is it too complex to do on the console? Uh, the answer is no, especially if you're an experienced surgeon who's already doing robotic prostatectomy, which is what the bulk of the cell surgeries are done on this platform. Then you're only looking at about 10 to 12 cases um, as, um, as your learning curve cases. But what about your uh, enucleation procedures, which is clearly not the case as compared to the robot, because this is a prospective study. Where out of nine centers, um, three three centers abandoned um, the idea of uh, adopting laser enucleation. And even among those uh, who completed uh, their participation, 
only four continue to do this as a long term basis. So the uptake is uh, generally low. And uh, this is after 20, trying for 20 cases. So, so clearly the learning curve in general seem to be well above uh, 20 cases. <clears throat> so do we have a consensus of what is the gold standard enucleation approach? But historically open nowadays, it's considered as a uh, enucleation with the laser. But uh, is it time for uh, robotics to be considered as a gold standard? Well, if you look at the literature between comparing open and uh, robotic uh, simple prostatectomy, uh, we have uh, about less than 1,000 patients in the recent systematic review with operative time uh, clearly in favor of an open, a uh, simple prostatectomy. But if you look at all the other parameters, blood loss, catheter, irrigation times, hospital stay, transfusion rates and complications, all of in all these areas, robotic approach uh, is uh, favorable. However, the only drawback in these studies I can come across is the volume of prostate gland before study seemed to be fairly low, except for one or two studies where it is about 150 grams. And if you look at the study where prostate volume before surgery was roughly 240 on average, again, operative time is the only place where the open approach is quicker, but definitely blood loss hospitals today are better in the robot and all the other parameters are quite comparable. So clearly <coughs> robotic simple prostatectomy is better than open, but how is it when you compare with laser enucleation procedures? Not many studies comparing head to head. In this systematic review this year, less than 1,000 patients. Again, so very similar uh, outcomes. Uh, but again, the problem there is the size of the gland. Um, is uh, don't have uh, much studies having uh, large volume glands uh, um, in their study group. And in fact, there is uh, only one RCT so far where um, the study has been conducted on prostate volumes more than 120 cc. And what does this show in general? Um, very similar outcomes like uh, comparing to open, but the um, advantage with the robotic approach is uh, it does offer a uh, choice of removing more prostate tissue, uh, but no um, uh, significant complications. Uh, but uh, statistically, both these parameters uh, are, are not significant though. Now, um, so does this mean uh, you know, one is better than the other? Well, this is a debate uh, that's been addressed uh, in, uh, in European urology recently, and the argument uh, seemed to be slightly going in favor of the robotic uh, simple prostatectomy. Now, the only recognized disadvantage is the catheter uh, time and the robotic approach where it tends to stay for a week or so, but in laser enucleation, it comes out fairly soon but it does have, cause urethral trauma, especially with the duration of procedure you know, with large glands and also very steep learning curve for uh, the whole new enucleations. It also is a disadvantage that we can't uh, treat other associated uh, bladder conditions mentioned here. Now, the biggest uh, uh, issue usually is the operative time. Now, by the time you position patient, put ports, and then reach your uh, prostate. It takes about half an hour robotically, but it endoscopically you reach the gland straight away. But once the gland is very large, even if you reach the gland straight away with your um, uh, laser enucleation, it takes a very long time to dissect off the adenoma and then a long time to morselate these uh, large adenomas. And clearly that's where the robotic approach uh, is seems favorable because the this part of the procedure seemed to be fairly standardized and hence the overall operating time is always slightly longer but never too long when it compares when it comes to uh, very large glands um, what's missing in the literature is um, this clearly this uh, message of comparing the high volume glands about uh, volume of prostate more than 150 or 200 gram size that's where the data is uh, significantly lacking and also about the storage symptoms and other long-term problems about readmission and intervention rates and so on so where do we stand uh, i think uh, robotic simple prostatectomy definitely has a role it's probably well beyond the investigation uh, procedure investigation as it's safe comparable 
and a feasible option, but I think this is particularly for prostate that is well beyond uh, 150 grams or so. Uh, and it is quite an easy uh, approach uh, for people who are already been doing robotic surgery. Learning curve um, is much better than uh, laser enucleation surgery. Thanks for listening and thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Gokul. That's what quite a in-depth presentation on the robotic assisted um, pro simple prostatectomy. Not a procedure which is uh, quite frequently followed or done, but uh, that's quite inspiring for people to start. Next, I invite uh, Mr. Sanjay Rajpal, again another very good close friend, to discuss the green light vaporization of the prostate. Sanjay? Uh, good evening, friends in India, and uh, good afternoon to friends in the UK. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about green light laser for uh, BPH, PPO. Just a second. So my outline of the talk is going to cover the technology, the technique, and the patient group who would benefit from this treatment. So green light laser technology has been present since mid-2000. Um, it basically is um, passing an NDAG uh, laser beam through a KTP or a lithium triborate crystal, which results in halving the wavelength and uh, doubling the frequency. So the laser beam which comes out is um, in the visible spectrum, green in color, and measures 532 nanometers. This particular wavelength is important because it's strongly absorbed by oxyhemoglobin, and this is used for um, getting the therapeutic response. So there are two concepts uh, resulting from uh, this. Um, uh, when you have an energy source, um, which raises the temperature of tissues greater than 100 degrees centigrade, uh, it causes vaporization. And when it runs between 50 and 100 degrees centigrade, uh, you get a coagulated necrosis response. Again, this slide uh, shows you, sorry, go back, the depth of um, vaporization or tissue response from green light laser compared to the other available lasers. So it varies between 0.8 to 1 millimeters. And what's most important about green light laser is that in addition to the vaporization defect, you also have a coagulate, coagulation at, at the rim, which usually measures around 2 millimeters. And that's uh, an important point um, for this laser. So how has this laser evolved? So it started as an 80 watt machine. And uh, once it was commercially marketed, the, um, the clinical use identified some issues, particularly that it was causing more coagulation rather than vaporization. Postoperatively, there was issues with dysuria and also the need for early retreatment. So that led to a higher powered laser, which is the 120 watt, followed by the 180 watt, which is commonly used. In addition to changing the actual laser machine, the company also made changes into the fiber. So currently, uh, the fibers which we use for vaporization is called the Moxie fiber, and it's liquid cooled with steel capped fibers. So they've not only made the fibers more sturdy, but also um, the energy coming out of these fibers um, is increased by 50%. Uh, hence, you can have a better efficiency of vaporization. So if someone is going to adapt this technology in the unit, in addition to getting the laser kit, the training, what else do we need? So bottom of the screen, you can see uh, this is a standard uh, continuous flow resectoscope, which we have for TURP. Um, the only adaptation to this would be a laser bridge, um, which is shown. So you don't need the working element, you just use a laser bridge. You also have a 23 French continuous irrigating scope. This is from Stotts, which comes with its own laser bridge. Um, you will also require a camera filter, which is provided by the laser manufacturer. Uh, we use saline at room temperature and there will be laser safety goggles, which, which, which are applicable. So um, how do we get uh, technically competent using this laser? So I think there are four main points, but for me, the most important one is how do you handle this fiber? Um, I'll come to this. 
So when we talk about the fiber, um, the fiber is a side firing uh, laser. Um, it's a non-contact uh, side firing laser, which the incident beam comes out at 70 degrees uh, forward. So within the fiber, the company has made these markings, which are the blue arrow and the red arrow you can see. So you should have the blue in front of you always. Uh, and that tells you that the incident beam is perpendicular to the tissues. So you're vaporizing correctly perpendicular. If you see the red, there's a risk that the incident beam will hit your telescope. The next thing uh, is to maintain uh, fiber to tissue distance. So it's approximately one and three millimeters. A good visual cue will be the metal cap, which is in front of, which, which is easily visualized through your camera. And that's about 1.8 millimeters. So that's the distance you need to keep from the tissue. Now, if you're too close to the tissue, uh, the heat will cause damage to the laser fiber. Um, and if you're too far away, you cause more coagulation than vaporization. So it's to have the optimal distance is important. The next concept is the sweep speed. So it's usually, um, you, you have a smooth arc of 30 degrees, which you need to maintain, and about two sweeps per second. Coming to the power settings, uh, the laser has a vaporization module and a coagulation module. The vaporization starts from 80 going up to 180 watts. The coag starts at 35 going up to 40. So you start off with 80 when, you, when you've got occlusive lobes because you're uh, despite your efforts, the fiber will be in contact with the tissue. So you need to create the space. And once you created the space for your fiber to move freely and the fluid to, to move backwards and forwards so that you have good visualization, you then start increasing the power. So this, these are key vaporization principles. Uh, essentially, uh, what you start uh, is once you have done an atraumatic cystoscopy, and you've done, uh, you've confirmed your landmarks, you start with the laser beam and you start at low energy. So the first step would be to get uh, grooves at five and seven o'clock, just like a blood and a concession. So that will tell, tell you your level and all you need to do is to follow this level on either side to deobstruct the tissue. You have to titrate your energy, which uh, as needed for efficient vaporization. As someone has, you know, become a bit more confident in the learning curve, you will quickly move on to the high energy settings because once you're able to use the high energy, you're able to vaporize more and hence you're able to clear the gland better. And finally, you, you ensure hemostasis. You can use the coag function in the laser. Very rarely, if you have a bleeding point which, which needs extra support, you can take a bug bee, diathermy, or if you have access to bipolar, you may need it. But it happens very rarely once you've got an established laser practice. There are, um, Kevin Zahn is a Canadian urologist who's been uh, writing a lot. Uh, he's got a video YouTube channel, which has got a lot of videos. He's also written articles, which are quite useful. So how has this technique evolved? Um, what we talked about is photoselective vaporization. There's an ejaculation sparing technique where a one centimeter rim or a rim of tissue around the veru is left behind. And this is thought to um, reduce retrograde ejaculation. Vapor incision is for bigger prostates, where in addition to vaporization, you're incising tiny bits, which then go into the bladder and you pick it up with biopsy forceps at the end. And atomical vaporization is a concept uh, where you start with at the apex of the prostate, particularly for large median lobes. So one of the limitations of this laser in the early phase is firing the side firing laser in an intravesical prostate. So there's always a concern that you could get the UOs. Um, so anatomical vaporization uh, possibly helps reduce that and also to clear a large median lobe. So you, you go to the level of the capsule at the apex, and then uh, just like an enucleation, you, you, create, you lift the lobe from the apex going to the bladder neck. And then because it's a side firing laser, you do an in-situ vaporization after you removed the, you know, after you separated the lobe. The further step is green light laser enucleation, which is similar to uh, similar principles to OLED. Um, so we've now understood the technology and the technique. Uh, so whom can we offer? So these are the EAU guidelines, which you've already seen in previous presentations. So when we look at um, <clears throat> patients who are eligible, um, EAU recommends patients uh, who have a prostate volume from 30 to 80 mils. Among the list of options, laser finds this place. And there's also mention about um, uh, use of laser uh, vaporization in 
larger prostates, and this is particularly uh, applicable once the 180 watt machine has been commonly used. Uh, an important group of patients, um, you, which you can see here, are uh, patients who are anticoagulant and antiplatelet therapy, where laser vaporization is again recommended. So the question would be, why should someone um, invest in this technology? Um, I think uh, there's good evidence to show that the nature of this laser, you're able to carry out the cavitating procedure with reduced bleeding, uh, you, your length of stay and catheterization are reduced and your outcomes are similar to TRP. Uh, it is very useful in high-risk patients on anticoagulants and antiplatelet agents. Now, in the limitations, there is no histology and post-op dysuria was always a concern, but that was more uh, with the first uh, initial type of lasers, the 80 watt machine. Uh, with the 180 watt machine, uh, recent evidence and my clinical practice as well, we don't see dysuria. Again, the evidence um, in the early days talked about high reintervention rates, and this was relevant for the 80 and 120 watt with the 180 watt laser and uh, the process of uh, better training and understanding the technology. The reintervention rates should be you know, are comparable to the other treatments. <clears throat> These are some uh, slides and from the Goliath trial, which was a randomized controlled trial comparing uh, green light with TRP. I know it's it's slightly old, but it gives you a flavor. So um, when compared to bipolar, this is a subgroup and analysis comparing green light with bipolar TRP, you're able to see that um, the green light laser is comparable for IPSS improvement, QMAX, and also compl complication free rates at 24 months. Further, the length of catheterization is less than TRP. Um, return to stable health and median length of stay is uh, in the hospital stays less compared to bipolar TRP. So um, there was a talk on GERFT. I think GERFT has, um, has influenced how we have started to look at patients with BPO and the green light laser has hugely benefited, but what, what it has done is it's made us think, uh, uh, think differently and also adapt our uh, resources according to the available uh, need of our population. Um, I'd like to conclude that um, there isn't uh, an accepted gold standard uh, single procedure. It should be a portfolio of options for BPO. I think green light laser has its place in uh, prostate, uh, prostate 30 to 80 mils. It is associated with a short learning curve, usually 10 patients or so. The hemostatic properties are uh, advantageous in patients with high risk bleeding. And the, the, this laser is evolving. The techniques like anatomical vaporization could help uh, with larger prostates. So this is a goodbye from Yorkshire Dales. And once, as I conclude, I just want to put this thought provoking um, article about history of um, surgical treatment of the prostate. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. That was a very nice uh, presentation on green light laser. I have a question for you. Say, for example, in uh, countries like India or Pakistan, if a unit has a 80 watt or 120 watt machine, will you advise them to directly upgrade to 180 or the previous generations are equally good and they can hold on? Uh, I think um, the 80 watt machine definitely um, I would say that they need to, you know, they need to put it in a side. 120 watt machine is reasonable. And if you stick to volumes up to 80, 80 cc prostate, you will be able to get a reasonable outcomes. Um, what, what you don't have the advantage is that the newer moxie fibers, you know, the advantage from uh, operative time basis, tackling bigger volumes is better with the 180 watts. So 120 watts is still possible to be used because your Goliath trial had majority of the participants were using the 120 watt and you could see the results that it's non-inferior to TRP. Thank you, Sanjay. That's very useful. I'm sure this will be quite inspiring for those who have plenty of patients with anticoagulants because that's where the laser has the main role. Next, I invite another one of my local close friend, Mr. Viney During. He's going to discuss on whole meme enucleation of the prostate. Yes, Viney. Uh, 
thank you for inviting me to come to speak to this group today. I'm a local urologist from uh, Wolverhampton in the West Midlands in the UK. Um, can you see my uh, presentation okay? Yes, Wayne, please. So a lot of what, um, uh, or the pleasure of going last in a, uh, um, uh, talking in a group like this is a lot of what I have to say will have been said by others. But the history of a nucleation begins with open, um, uh, simple retropubic prostatectomy as depicted here. The important point in this slide to note is, of course, that the finger is used as a blunt dissecting tool to separate the adenoma from the surgical capsule. This, however, is associated with a significant degree of morbidity in terms of blood loss and, and uh, recovery from the open wound. And so efforts have been made to look for more minimally invasive techniques um, to allow the same um, surgical outcomes, particularly in the larger gland. This is one of my um, favorite papers. It is the first description of a transurethral um, um, uh, enucleation of the prostate gland. But you will see that this uh, paper actually origi originates from 1983. Monopolar energy was used um, with a modified receptor scope to actually enucleate the prostate in much the same way as we now tend to understand the term for uh, endoscopic enucleation. Unfortunately, this paper was published in Japan and there was uh, very little impact from this paper. And, um, and the findings of the uh, authors was very much unrecognized. But this does highlight the fact that almost any energy source can be used to enucleate the prostate. And so although I've been asked to talk about HOLEP, I just wanted to um, have a little plug for this term, anatomical enucleation of the prostate, um, or AEEP. This gentleman, Thomas Hermerman, um, who is a German-Swiss urologist and the inventor of the thulium laser, and also the bipolar probe for enucleation of the prostate, coined the term um, that we often use now, which is a nucleation is a nucleation is a nucleation. But of course, I've been tasked with discussing with you holmium laser enucleation of the prostate. So um, the holmium laser itself um, is a laser which is pulsed and emits light energy at a frequency of 2,100 nanometers. It produces different effects depending on the distance and the power settings of the laser um, when it is being applied to tissue. When in close contact with tissue, there is a direct cutting effect. However, most usefully in terms of soft tissue enucleation is with a um, very short distance, these pulsed um, um, energy bursts produce a bubble which rapidly expand and contract and actually cause separation of the tissue which acts as a blunt dissector in much the way that the finger does in an open operation. There is also heat generated locally, which leads to um, hemostasis. Here is a video um, which is actually um, uh, uh, showing part of a home laser enucleation by a close friend and mentor of mine, Mr. Anish Chakravarti, who is currently shown here enucleating a median lobe of a prostate during a low bar technique. As you can see, uh, during most of this procedure, he's not actually in contact with the tissue uh, and is just a short distance from the tissue, which allows these bubbles to disrupt the tissue and cause blunt dissection. Shortly, you'll also be able to see a, a, a small little bleeding point, which he's able to uh, um, cause hemostasis by simply defocusing or moving slightly away from the tissue at the time to allow for uh, hemost the hemostatic action to take place, as you can see here. So TURP, uh, sorry, HOLEP itself was first di um, described in 1996 by Gilling in New Zealand. Um, this was after originally starting with ablative techniques with the holmium laser and moving to resection, but finally with the advent of the morselator um, uh, and, and endonucleation was, was, was performed. In 1999, this um, series was published comparing TURP to holmium and showed at least equivalence with TURP at that time. Since then, however, 
multiple papers have been written and many meta-analyses have been, con uh, co uh, have been um, uh, compiled, which have allowed TURP to be compared to HOLEP. Indeed, in this meta-analysis where multiple modalities of BPH treatments were compared, including colmium laser nucleation, HOLEP was found to be the only treatment which um, um, caused a significant reduction in IPSS score. Also, holmium laser nucleation um, was statistically the only treatment which was comparably better than TURP at improving uh, maximum flow rate. And there was no um, TUR syndrome or, or um, significant bleeding complications associated with holmium laser nucleation either. Holmium nucleation was also the only one of these procedures which did not re require intervention for recurrent benign prosthetic hypertrophy in the past. And this is believed to be due to the anatomical complete removal of adenoma. Mucosal injuries, however, were, were, uh, uh, of the bladder were noted and bladder perforation and capsular perforation noted at low rates as well. Although these are low risks, they are certainly um, uh, worthy of consideration. In terms of follow-up and urodynamic assessment, HOLAP, as you can see here, has shown a vastly improved um, a disobstruction of the system as compared to TURP. So HOLAP has also been shown in meta-analyses to have a shorter catheterization time than TURP, reduced blood loss, we requiring um, uh, comparably fluid transfusions also but it does take a longer time than the previous gold standard of TURP. In this, in this series of meta-analysis, urethral strictures were of a, um, there was no statistical difference with the amount of um, urethral strictures, although there was a tendency um, towards um, more strictures in the HOLAP group. And stress union continence in the, this meta-analysis was comparable to So there is significant level one evidence supporting the use of HOLAP uh, as it's the only BPH treatment to that uh, 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 that really has demonstrated significantly uh, or significant improvements over TURP and durability also. Of course, HOLAP is often thought of as being used in the larger group and there is evidence to, in the larger prostate group and there is evidence to support this also. In the patients with chronic retention in unselected cases, catheter free rates have been um, demonstrated in Amy Cranbeck's group in the United States of up to 99%. And when looking in patients with urodynamic bladder dysfunction, 100% of patients in the same group were found to be catheter free post HOLAP where they had detrusor hypocontractility. But um, a group that I find fascinating myself is uh, the group that had non-neurogenic, acontractile cath um, uh, bladders proven on neurodynamics, 95% of those were still catheter-free post-HOLAP. This is, of course, a group of patients who are often uh, not offered um, any bladder outflow surgery if they're found to have an acontractile bladder. HOLAP has also been proven to be both um, safe and technically feasible after other BPH treatments. So, in many ways, HOLAP really ought to be considered as a new gold standard for the surgical management of BPH in the 21st century. Patients undergoing HOLAP have a greater improvement in their postoperative QMAX, a greater reduction in postoperative um, um, subjective scores, and lower retreatment rates. They do, however, have um, longer times in hospital, um, uh, despite shorter, uh, sorry, longer time in theatre. But this is offset by um, shorter catheterization times and potentially shorter times in hospital too. The urological community, therefore, I believe, should embrace HOLEP as a new gold standard for BPH therapy, especially in men with large prostates who otherwise would be considered for open therapy. I shan't go through all of the. the I have a few slides detailing um, uh, various meta analyses, but um, as we've already discussed, HOLAP has been shown to be at least comparable, if not better, than TURP in many of the parameters. Certainly um, comparable with open prostatectomy, although with less com with less morbidity associated with it. And uh, in terms of other um, laser techniques, including vaporization and thulamine laser, there is again uh, a tendency towards HOLAP being the, the, the better of the treatment modalities. 
There is, however, a large learning curve with HOLEP, which um, has, has led to caution um, needing to be um, given when people are starting this um, procedure. This was um, looked at in a study back in 2016, which Gokul has already um, uh, discussed, where half of the centres that entered the trial actually abandoned, to, uh, abandoned HOLEP. And the most common reasons cited for this were operating time and the difficulty of the enucleation itself. The recommendations of the authors was that a more intensely mentored and structured training program should be instituted and here in the UK, led by um, a, a, a surgeon in Cambridge, Tevaho, a new HOLAP user group has been established, although it is still somewhat in its infancy. Systematic reviews of um, the whole learning curve has also suggested that there are approximately 25 to 50 cases in a structured mentoring system are required in order to um, reach full competency with whole Essentially, the side is just saying the same thing that, 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 that um, investigators have found that the enucleation itself is the most difficult step of the procedure and given the fact that the median lobe tends to be the easy, easiest part if doing a three-lobe technique, the classical definition or description of the procedure, then median lobe um, enucleation may be useful um, alone whilst overcoming one's learning curve. There have, however, been advances in the technique of HOLEP, and this um, 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 is nicely demonstrating the uh, on-block enucleation of HOLEP which starts with an early apical release with an encircling incision at the apex to separate the adenoma from the sphincter mechanism and then gradually um, uh, removing the whole gland or the adenoma on block and releasing it into the bladder before morselation. I would highly recommend looking at the series of HOLEPs by uh, Dr. Fernando Gomez Sancho, which are freely available on his YouTube channel where there are many, many cases, all describing the on-block technique. Although nothing is new under the sun, and the same author that first described the nucleation from Japan back in 19, uh, 1983 also produced this paper in 89, which actually described a very similar technique um, uh, for enucleation of the prostate, um, although again, this was not recognized at the time. There's been very little in the way of proving whether or not an on-block enucleation may reduce the learning curve, but some of the papers that I was able to find have suggested that, that, that it significantly reduces the operating time as compared to the traditional three or even two lobe techniques. And this has been uh, uh, um, uh, described as possibly also improving people's learning curves at, at doing this, this procedure. From my own practice, actually, I move very quickly from a two and three load technique to an on-block technique because I found it much easier that once you were in the surgical plane, rather than having to find it on multiple occasions, it could just be followed once. Other advances in the procedure itself are uh, to do with the laser itself. Some of uh, the manufacturers of the laser, so, um, including Luminous, who now have Moses technology and virtual basket by Quanta, um, have led to uh, improved efficacy of the laser itself. I have a quick video here, if it will play, um, which demonstrates the Moses technology. As you'll be able to see, a second uh, on the um, original video at the top here, you can see the micro bubble which I described earlier. With Moses technology, there is a second bubble which passes through the first and leads to greater penetration and depth of energy being transmitted. This allows for greater hemostasis and also more e efficient enucleation of the tissue at the same time. Getting it right first time, I believe that whole laser enucleation of the prostate in most cases does in itself get, get it right first time. We've already had um, uh, a talk about the Gerft Academy and its uh, recommendations within the UK treatment practice. And as you've already seen on a previous slide, the, they have produced this algorithm for the management of um, bladder outflow obstruction in males. 
as you can see right throughout the algorithm, except for with the exception of the small prostate with a tight bladder neck. Anatomical enucleation of the prostate is the only modality and the only treatment which um, is capable of treating all sizes of prostates, which they recommend. So in conclusion, uh, the little slogan, don't hesitate, enucleate, I think is, 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 is a key one, really, because home laser enucleation of the prostate is the most versatile of all of the um, treatment options. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vaini. It was a very nice and uh, in-detail presentation. I have one question for you before we conclude this webinar. Uh, there is no doubt that anatomical enucleation of the prostate is here to stay. But if an uh, institute or a practitioner is planning to get on, what is your advice in the energy source between thulium and holmium? And is there any major difference or the enucleation with both the lasers are same? So I have very little experience personally with thulium laser. However, there are some um, key differences between the two types of lasers. Thulium is a continuous wave laser, whereas holmium is a pulse laser. And as I described in the mechanism of action, although with holmium indeed one can cut, with um, actually the most useful um, effect that it has is this blunt dissection, which helps you to stay within within the correct plane. With thulium, it is it is without a doubt possible to enucleate as well. It is very good at hemostasis, but you do not get the same um, blood dissection quality. So one needs to cut. So one has to be very, very aware of where you are to ensure that you're not cutting out width of the capsule. And so for me, um, holmium is the better of the modalities. A lot of people or videos and things that are live demonstrations that I've seen of thulium, one will cut, use it as a hemostatic agent, but then you're having to use the scope itself um, for blunt dissection. That has the slight downside that you're, you can be putting traction on the sphincter mechanism at the same time. And I believe, and although it's it gets to be proven in data, that this may well have something to do with a transient um, incontinence that patients are seeing. So with an on-block anatomical enucleation with a holmium laser, I think we're seeing less um, incontinence than we have in the past. Thank you, Vaini. That was very helpful. Um, for the delegates who have signed up, as you have seen, we have discussed various things, not just the energy sources, not just the surgical techniques. We discussed about the pathway, we discussed about the one-stop clinics, about the guidelines, about the impact of GRIFT, and uh, we have discussed some energy sources also. There is a big difference with the array of topics what we discussed in the BPH webinar this year compared to the same May 2021 webinar from ITRU. I'm very sure next year, May 2023, when we do the BPH, there will be some more new topics, possibly some of the new energy sources, which we discussed as a very um, early stages will be in a much more prominent stage. I hope the delegates who signed off get the best out of this webinar, and I'm very sure the program will be available as a recorded session, which will be useful for future revisions. My thanks for all the delegates who have dedicated the time for preparing such a detailed presentation and uh, sincere thanks for the backstage dream without which the audiovisual won't be as excellent as this one. Thank you very much. Wishing you a very nice rest of the weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. We are offering now. Thank you. That was very good. And uh, I'm so glad to see that the whole program went without any hitch. Thank you for the whole team. Can I request the team members to switch on the video for a quick uh, screenshot selfie, including audiovisual guys and SIPLA uh, uh, team, everyone, please. It's nice to see everyone. We don't have enough time to see the faces in the starting. Tanuj. You're still traveling. I thought you may have reached Haryana by the time <laughs> we finish the jam. meeting. <laughs> Second the jam, sir. Thank you, Milap, for joining. Um, Kastub, uh, you haven't got a video in the... Yeah, thank you for coming. Good. I think the couple of other support guys uh, don't have the video set up. Just give me one minute for a selfie in the count of three. So smile, please. One, two, three.
Thank you. That's for the Twitter and the future records. Thank you very much. Before we uh, close the show, any feedbacks from any of the delegates? Um, Kastu, what do you think from your end? Yeah, yeah. sir, uh, I'll just uh, give an update in terms of participation. So it was uh, for, like uh, any other webinar from more than 20 countries. Uh, oh, so 20 countries. Mm. Roughly around 200 plus delegates were there. And average uh, 30 to 35 minutes, everyone was plugged in. Meaning if there was someone who was logging in, he was at least doing two or three sessions and then probably this is average while yeah. some of them would have listened to three to four sessions or five sessions some of you some of them would have dropped at uh, maybe one or two but on an average 200 plus registration sir across 20 countries most of them from india but usually we get uh, many people from uh, middle east and africa and even uk roughly 10 10 to 15 percent of the population is always from uk 10 15 percent from africa some from uh, southeast asia as well and the others mostly from india thank you kastab that was very encouraging data and uh, thank you for you and also specifically the cipla to support this program to run yeah. for now almost there is only one year. one uh, suggestion which has come out now uh, doctor uh, it's that there was there used to be an mcq contest yeah which used to be there so uh, doctor has requested from stockport i don't know where this place is stockport he has requested UK. that uh, uh, you reinitiate uh, the uh, the mcqs yeah we usually do but uh, yeah. i haven't got a very uh, i don't know i was yes. quite neutral on the Maybe feedback this, so yeah. it's nice if somebody is expecting we should be able to do yes. it the mcqs are yes. really good to keep them engaged yeah sure thank you very much Thanks. any any points from the delegates uh, nice to see everyone <laughs> uh, i've heard of viney i've seen tanuj on twitter so it's good to see them and uh, Thank you for bringing us together. Yeah, no, thanks, Anand. Uh, great to be here. Yeah. And I think the whole whole thing uh, from LUT's assessment uh, um, and initial Dr. Bhatia's talk to all, the, it's very good from an international perspective. If I, because obviously my mind keeps working on that. So I'll ask for a recording because sure. setting up LUT's clinic and all this will be really useful um, for projects which, like, for example, we if we are starting anywhere internationally. Yeah, that, that's um, the main idea. So not not just to exactly teach the TRP clinical things. We, I want to really <laughs> yes. cover yes. every nook and corner of the BPE treatment. Yeah. Absolutely. So that was uh, that was very thoroughly covered. Everything. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Well done. Amazing. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Aini. Thank you, everyone. I'm, I will allow you all to have the rest of the weekend. Thank you for your time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.